Uh, can you hear me now, Joe? Can anyone hear me? I can. Can you hear me and Paul? Is anyone else trying to get into the uh, local plan examination? Yeah, I am, but maybe you can't hear me. Yes. I can't hear anyone else. No, no. Okay. John, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, John, hi, it's Paul Jenkins from CPRE. I can't hear anyone at all. I'm trying to get, yeah, I don't know if it started or what. No, there is a delay. Uh, as, as, um, yeah. But does Nigel, uh, Nigel, your, your vision and sound is on. So you can be seen and heard. Louise? I don't, he can't hear, can he? No, no, he's not been accepted yet, I think. Oh, really? I can see him. He's got his video on. Oh, okay. Yes, so can I. Yeah. So can I, but he obviously so doesn't. Why can I see your video? I can't see anybody else. Yeah. Everybody else is he's off. Yes. Oh. Yeah, sorry. I don't know. No. I can't hear anyone. Can anyone hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you wave if you can hear me? <laughs> Uh, yeah. Nigel, I can hear you. I can't hear anyone. I can see you and hear you, Nigel. Paul, we're just waiting for um, some technical issues to get the live stream okay. working, which it is now. So we're just waiting for the meeting to start. So if you just. Oh, great, Karen. Yeah, that's great. So we'll get um, whoever speaks will be in view because I've got a funny view. Yeah, but... yeah don't worry. Uh, Jim, you're not you missing anything. Right. Yeah, I can hear okay. you. Yeah, don't worry. Thanks, Karen. Bye. Can someone wave if they could hear me? Hello, everybody. Can I be seen and heard? Yes. Yep, yes, I can sir. see and heard, can I? I'm seeing a shaking of heads there. Yes. Mr. Mr. Jacobs? I think it might be a problem at your end, Mr. Jacobs, because everybody else is giving me thumbs ups. Uh, can I just ask that everybody turns their camera off apart from the council, please? So I just have the council on screen. How do we do that? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, good morning, every uh, everybody, and apologies for the 15 minute uh, delay in starting this morning. I hope people will uh, appreciate that, given uh, the issues that we experienced around live streaming earlier in the week, it was uh, very important. I I can personally this morning that uh, we're live before uh, we're making a start. So I had to do that before uh, before starting. And uh, I'm, I make few apologies for it, but uh, but uh, I'm sorry it's led to a, uh, a slight delay to the start of proceedings. Okay, so, uh, so good morning. This is the matter five session, which is part of the independent examination of the uh, Bedford local plan 2040. For those who haven't been at a session before, uh, my name is Darren McCreary. Um, I'm the uh, I'm the inspector who's been appointed to examine the plan for soundness and legal compliance. Louise Sinjin Howe is our program officer. Uh, Louise works independently of the council and is responsible for the administrative arrangements and also for getting us all here virtually uh, virtually today so and i know it's been a uh, it's been a real task so my thanks do go out to uh, to louise in particular for uh, for, for making this uh, this uh, this happen uh, including uh, holding the, the the various training sessions that have taken place to hopefully put people in a place to be able to participate so i am i am very uh, very very grateful uh, to her so a few uh, a few housekeeping points, and I don't know about everybody else, but uh, 
since uh, since lockdowns, I've I've tended to avoid virtual events uh, like like the plague. So this is uh, this is a first one for me for a while. Uh, so do uh, so. I'm sorry if I'm a little bit a uh, little bit rusty. I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure the dark days will all come come flooding back uh, sooner rather than later. Um, so a reminder that if you have other electronic devices, if you can keep those to silent. Um, and also when you're not contributing to the sessions or not speaking, if you can keep your, uh, your microphone to mute um, and also uh, your camera off as well, that helps to preserve bandwidth, but it also helps me focus on the person that's actually speaking rather than the person that's making a cup of tea or whatever. So, um, so that would be helpful in terms of the council. I'd like uh, I like the council on screen at all times. I think that's fine for it just to be one member of the council there, but the main speaker is that's that's no problem. But as long as I have uh, I have someone from the council on screen, it just means I'm not talking to um, I'm not talking to blobs with initials on. Um, so uh, so although we're virtual, that obviously means this is a public meeting. It is being being live streamed on YouTube. Um, that was uh, that's an arrangement that's been put in place with the council by the council. But um, as I say, I've I've confirmed that this morning that that, that is the case. If you do experience uh, any connection difficulties um, or drop out, uh, try using the uh, the old classic sign out and sign back in again. That, that frequently uh, frequently works for for most people. Um, if you are having computer trouble. Uh, then uh, I believe there is a uh, there is a number that uh, on the meeting invite that allows you to dial in to uh, dial into the session. Uh, that allows you to dial it dial into the session. Sorry, Mr. Jacobs, can you put your can you put your mute on, your mic on mute, please? I can I can hear you. Please, thank you. Okay, um, so if we have any technical issues at this end and we need to take an unscheduled adjournment, then we'll uh, we'll do that if we can't resolve the issue live. So apologies, uh, apologies if we do have to do that, but that does happen from time to time. So quick run through on the uh, on the Excuse event me, management so side of things. Voice. I don't know if it's the same for everybody else. Mr. Shortland, you've lost. Mr. Shortland, can you hear me? Apparently it's only me. Please carry on. Okay, thank you. So a reminder that my role and the purpose of this examination is to examine whether the plan meets the legal requirements and whether it is sound in the way set out in the framework. Any person seeking to change or modify the plan needs to show why it's currently unsound and uh, how their change will address um, address the issue. If I believe any modifications uh, that might might be necessary, then I'll try and discuss those in the session if I if I can do or as soon as possible afterwards in any event. Any main modifications I confirm are necessary uh, will be subject to a full public consultation before I make my final recommendations in my report on the examination. So, as I said, we'll be looking at matter five, uh, which is the uh, spatial strategy and distribution of growth. We'll be following the um, the agenda that uh, that has been circulated and is available on the examination web page. If people don't uh, don't have it, it's quite a quite a lengthy agenda. So we've got quite a quite a bit of um, bit of biz business to get through. Um, so there'll be some areas where I don't have many questions. So the agenda is formulated based on the previous questions that I've asked, for which I have hearing statements from all parties. So there'll be some areas where I don't. Have to, uh, have to ask any questions, and there'll be other areas where I need to seek clarification. There'll also be space at the end of the agenda for people to raise any other issues. So the standard format, just like we were in, if, if we were in person, the standard format will be for me to start by asking the council to summarise their position on each item. What I'll then do is I'll then. Um, I'll then ask any preliminary questions I have before opening uh, opening the matter up for other contributions 
before then uh, asking the council to to respond. Uh, when any participant other than the council wants to speak, uh, please indicate by putting your, your virtual hand up, which I believe you've been shown how to uh, how to do. I'll then ask you to speak at the appropriate time. When speaking, please remember to turn your microphone and camera on and then off again uh, when you've finished as you'll remain visible and audible. All your previous submitted written evidence can be taken as read uh, and need not be repeated at length. As always, keep contributions as direct as possible uh, so I don't lose the trail of what you're saying. A reminder that there'll be no opportunity to cross-examine any party and any questions um, need to uh, need to come through me in the, uh, in the usual way. Um, you'll also generally only be able to speak once on each agenda, agenda item, so don't expect a, a, a right of reply. With this being a virtual session and inherently harder to control, that, that will be enforced uh, probably more, more rigorously than it would do in person. So please do, do bear, bear that in mind that there won't be a, a, a second bite of a cherry, so, so to speak. So that applies to each participant. So if you, uh, if you come from an organisation where you are hot seating, for example, so you have, you have two people, then that organisation should only really get one um, contribution rather than allowing everyone who's hot seating to, to also speak as that becomes unmanageable. I didn't see that. Okay, looking at the hearing programme, the uh, the matter seven, the matter five session, is it, it, it is down to last a, a day and a half. We have a busy agenda uh, and obviously we started a little bit late, but um, having, considering what we've already spoken about in the previous sessions, my um, aspiration is that hopefully we can progress through the agenda quickly and preferably uh, conclude it today if possible. Um, hopefully, uh, hopefully other parties can see the, the advantage of that and uh, will uh, will help us get to that point if we can. If it means we need to sit a little bit later uh, beyond the allotted uh, beyond the allotted time to allow that to happen, then I hope people appreciate the benefit of that as well. But we'll we'll talk about that as we get through the agenda and as we come to it. Um, before we move on, does anybody have any queries about the the process side of things? Please indicate by by putting your please. No, I'm not seeing not seeing anything. Okay, can we uh, can we go to the uh, can we start by introductions from the council's team, please? So, uh, Simon Bird, KC, can you hear me? Okay, I can. So, so, would it help if I introduce the team for today? So yes, please do that. Have, Thank that, you. That will help. Yeah. I mean, Mr. Gareth Draper will be dealing with the first item on the agenda. Then Mr. Martin Tidy, who you uh, met before, John Shortland, Carolyn Barnes, Jonathan Howes from ACOM, who uh, was at your session yesterday, Kim Wilson, and then Jill Cowie is the council's team for today. Thank you. Uh, th thank you for that, Mr. Uh, Mr. Bird. Sorry, was this somebody else? Is that everybody? Uh, yes, Ian Stannis from ACOM, who will do in traffic modelling should it should be needed. Sorry, I omitted his name. Don't uh, don't worry. I'm sure he'll take no offence. Okay. Um, so in terms of numbers, obviously we have. Um, I have a list of everybody who's who who we should be should have participating in front of me in terms of other participants. As we're as we're quite large in number today, rather than sort of going around everybody in a way that become might become quite unwieldy. If I if I can ask when when you make your first contribution, if you can just introduce yourself and say uh, where you're uh, who you're representing, that's probably a more efficient way to uh, way 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 to proceed. Hopefully, uh, hopefully that. Um, looking at the uh, participants list, I see I, I have a sort of names in a uh, names in front of me here. I will I will say say those names. I think you've I think most participants have uh, been instructed to sort of put their full name in and who they're representing. I can mainly just see the full name. So what I'll do is I'll uh, I'll just say whatever appears on my screen when I see a, a hand go up. So now's the time to make sure that you're happy with with whatever it is that uh, that, that that is up there. Okay. So we will uh, we'll move into the agenda. As I say, this is 
matter five the and what what i will say is as we're as we are virtual um i obviously you can't see but i'm i'm sat here with bits of paper to my left bits of paper to my right bits of paper in front of me and two screens in front of me so there may be a bit more shuffling around bit of this bit of that that doesn't mean that i'm not listening that simply means that i'm getting bits of paper i'm checking things i'm cross-referencing things on another screen so but hopefully that doesn't distract people people too much it's uh just a uh, just a necessity really okay so we'll come on to uh matter five which as i say is the spatial strategy and distribution of growth so here our, our specific policy focus is on uh two policies policy ds 2s and ds 5s of the uh of the local of the uh local plan 2040 so we'll start uh we'll start moving through the the agenda at uh, item uh at item one and apologies i seem to i seem to have started with the wrong bits of paper in front of me. Just uh, give me a second, just to grab a, just to grab the right bits of paper. Sorry about that. I think uh, I've probably started by breaching one of my own rules, which is a, uh, always a, always a good start, isn't it? So I have the uh, have the right bit of paper in front of me now, which is always helpful. So starting at uh, starting at sort of item one, which is around the plan period and, and vision. So so the um, the item I wanted to focus on here was uh, was MIQ two, which is. Um, which is uh, which is specifically on the issue of whether or not the plan should set development for large strategic extensions and new settlements within a thirty year time frame, paying regard to paragraph twenty two of the the MPPF. Um, I don't think this is a big point from my perspective. I just want to get the council's uh, council's response on that, please. So it's Mr. Draper, as I said. Mr. Draper, I think you're on mute. Can you hear me now? My mute is. My... No, we can hear. We can hear you now. Ah, okay, thank you. Uh, sorry about that. Um, good morning, sir. By way of quick introduction, I'm Gareth Draper. I'm a senior planner for the planning policy team at Bedford Borough Council. Um, we, uh, we we don't uh, feel it's um, necessary to extend um, the the vision for large uh, for for the strategic sites um, to 30 years. Um, the vast majority of growth in the sites that we have in the plan um, is um, going to be delivered before 2040, with only a very small amount um, spilling over that. Um, uh, the the, the New settlements that they're significant growth for the uh, the borough, but um, in the in the scheme of new settlements, they're not huge. Um, so we feel it's it's not necessary to extend that time period. Um, thank you. Okay. So um, I think in terms of the in terms of what paragraph twenty two sets out, it obviously refers to new settlements and significant extensions. I think I think most people would would regard what's contained in the plan as containing new settlements. So I think it, it is it is bit by paragraph 22, but the main tenant of your sort of representation on this issue seem to be about the amount of development that should be coming through within the plan period. And therefore there only being a, a small, a small amount that would come through after the plan period. And that being the justification for for, for paragraph 22 not applying in this case. Is that is that correct? Yes, sir, it is. Um, the the time scale for delivery is is um, say vast majority before twenty forty. Yeah. 
And uh, and in looking at that, I've obviously paid, paid regard also to what the PPG says in terms of policy requirements being applied, where most of the development arising from a large scale work from large scale developments proposed in a plan will be delivered well beyond the plan period. So, um, so I I think having having looked at that, that based on the information that you've submitted, that does that does look to be the case here. There's obviously a dispute about um, about you know, how much of the development will actually come through in the plan period, but working from the local authorities own assessment and taking that as as read for now, obviously we'll look at we'll look at land supply in in due course, then that that then that, that would seem to be seem to be the, the the case on the face of it. I I also paid regard as or looked as well at the vision for the for the in the arc prospectus as well, which does contain a, a vision through to, to 2050 as well, which the plan does create some um, some alignment with, doesn't it? Yes, sir. Um, we back at the beginning of the process um, of preparing the plan, we considered the length of time um, the plan should go to, um, uh, especially in in um, regard to the arc vision and uh, neighbouring authorities as well. Um, I think if um, uh, neighbouring authorities perhaps if the plans were continuing it, um, you know we would have looked at that more and there might have been a bit more of an alignment in decision um, as it is uh, the appropriate um, time period for this plan uh, to 2040 accords with the MPPF um, and that's the, the date that was selected. Okay thank you Th thank you for that that was just the clarification I was seeking on uh, on item one and MIQ2 uh, is there any contribution anybody wants to make on uh, on item one and MIQ2 any participant please uh, Mr uh, Mr Foragu Foragu sorry apologies I'm uh, I'm struggling with my reading it's, uh, it, please it, it's, it's okay me. It's okay, sir. I'll help, I'll help you out. It's uh, it's David Favarg um, here uh, from from Marin's representing. And then you froze. Oh, oh no! <laughs> can... <laughs> sorry, sorry. Can you say that again, sir? Yeah, it, it's David Favarg here um, from Marin's um, for representing Rainier Developments. Yeah. Um, can you hear me okay now, sir? I can hear you just fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think, I think our position on this is. I mean, the plan doesn't set a uh, a, a thirty year um, time frame in terms of MPPF twenty two, but but we think it should um, because of the reliance. It's a big reliance on major infrastructure improvements to deliver well, principally the the, the two new settlements. I mean, the plan relies on these two two new settlements delivering some seven thousand six hundred homes over just a ten year period. 2030 to 2040 each of those new settlements is is assumed to be delivering 3800 homes each um with leading leading times and and build out rates the likes of which um haven't been seen before you'll you'll see from our evidence sir that um in our in our matter five hearing statement that we've drawn attention to um the wixom's new settlement so we have evidence of what a new settlement in Bedford can deliver. Um, and that the, the Wixom's new settlement had a leading time of around nine years from a planning application first being submitted to, to first completions on site. And then we've got a long period of, of completions and build, well, build rates that we can look at. And that site was averaging 165 dwellings per annum. Well, for the two new settlements, at Kempston Hardwick and Little Barford, the council's assuming delivery rates of 300 to 600 dwellings per annum. So, yeah, you, you'll see that evidence in, in my hearing statement, sir. But basically, their delivery rates and, and leading times that just haven't been seen before, and we can benchmark that against against Wixom's. Um, okay. And obviously, all of that's reliant on big infrastructure. But even if that big infrastructure does come forward, you'd still be with realistic leading times and delivery rates be pushing over a 30 year time horizon as MPPF 22 envisages. Thank you, sir. So, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for, for, for that. Uh, Mr. Mr. Harris Emery. Uh, good morning, sir. Stephen Harris from Emery planning representing Holland's strategic land. 
Thank you. Um, yes, I think Mr. Favar has obviously just set out sort of the, the summary of the position. Um, so I don't disagree with what the Council and yourself are saying with regards to paragraph 22, but I think there's obviously quite a lot of concern from um, our clients' respective, but other obviously attendees to the examination as to those delivery rates. So really, I think in terms of the answer to this question can only really be done once you've obviously heard the examination, um, the evidence for matter 14, for example, and for each of the strategic extensions. So um, I say our, our view is certainly that the 400 dwellings post 2040 is very um, optimistic um, and a large proportion of those sites will be de delivering post 2040. And therefore our view is, that, you know, it should be a 30 year plan period um, going forward. So again, I don't want to go into too much detail now, but um, that's certainly where, what our position is. Okay, thank you. Th th thank you for that. I think Mr. Harris uh, made, a, made a very sensible point there around it. Uh, obviously, the council's position being the council's position at the, at the moment, but uh, depending on where we get to with, with land supply and uh, conclusions around delivery, which we're going to be subject to a later discussion, this, this may be an issue that we, we may or, or may not need to uh, Need to need to revisit. I think that's a, that's a sensible sensible observation. Anything further the council would like to add on uh, on item one? No, thank you, sir. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. So, it's the uh, it's the item on plan period and vision. I don't see any other other hands up on to contribute for that particular item. So we'll move on to number two now, which is around uh, growth uh, growth options. So we're looking at MIQ 3.3 here, which is um, assuming the amount of identified housing need and employment growth is soundly based. So we've had a, we've had two sessions, one each on, on those, one on housing growth, one on employment growth figures. So assuming those are, um, are soundly based, um, what options have been considered for accommodating the growth? I'm, having looked at the agenda here, I see I've, I've split MIQ, MIQ 3 up into, uh, into two bullets. I'm sure, I'm sure my reasons for doing that were incredibly uh, logical at the time, but having revisited, I'm, I'm not entirely sure why, why I did, I did that. There, there might have been a purpose. However, it's, um, it, it's escaped me now. So, so just to be clear, MIQ3, so that is the two, the two limbs I put there. Um, so the first one being the one I've read out, the second one around have reasonable alternatives being considered. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll tackle those as a as a single item rather than as as two um as two separate items if if that's okay as i say i'm sure there was some logic to me doing it but um, it escapes me at the moment so let's uh, let, let's just proceed on, on that basis so we'll just be hearing miq3 in one in one go so um can you uh, so can can the council start by summarizing the uh the options that they've considered for for accommodating the growth that we've discussed yeah and so is mr tidy on this Thank you, sir. I trust I can be heard okay? Yes. Right. Um, I will um, answer these questions um, by relating to the development strategy topic paper, which is document F1. And I'll just briefly summarise some of the uh, and, and highlight some of the main points of the process we followed. Um, if you turn to page two of the development strategy topic paper, um, uh, paragraph 2.3, this explains that six potential growth locations were identified as building blocks, and this was the starting point for option generation. The potential growth locations, as you can see, were urban based, A421 based, rail, east west rail with a northern station, dispersed, and new settlements. Uh, if we move on to paragraph 3.4, Four over the page. Um, we're now looking at the draft plan stage. And in paragraph 3.4, uh, it explains that the six potential growth locations were drawn together into five broad components of growth, which make up the types of location where growth is likely to occur. So the components of the growth um, were within the urban area, adjoining the urban area, village related, new settlements and the A421 transport corridor with rail based growth um, and uh, is focused on planned stations at Kempston Hardwick, Stuartby, 
Wixoms and Tempsford and also Neats. Um, and you can see there's four subcategories or subcomponents there. Yeah. Um, moving on to 311 to 312, these explain the assumptions that were made about the amounts of development within each broad component. These assumptions enabled the generation of a long list of 13 options for the draft plan. The assumption of 500 dwellings in each key service centre represented the amount of growth that the council had assessed as being necessary to support a new primary school. It's probably helpful to turn to page 22, where table one provides a useful overview of the options. The sustainability appraisal had already assessed the um, the most sustainable broad locations as being the urban and adjoining the urban area components. So as a result, these components feature in nine of the 13 options. Nevertheless, in order to provide a range of all possible combinations of broad components, village related growth combined with other components features in five of the options. We move on to paragraph 4.2 on page 38. We're now looking at the, the plan for submission. And paragraph 4.2 explains how the assumptions for the broad components that make or made up the draft options were refined. This took account of the increase in housing need as a result of changes to the standard method calculation, recent completions, and importantly, more detailed work on the appraisal of individual sites. This gave more confidence in on the capacity of the broad components to deliver growth. The assessment of all the submitted sites included consideration against the sustainability objectives. So the strategy was not decided in isolation from the available sites. The location of all sites was taken into account in deciding the strategy. Um, the location um, of the, I mean, just uh, carry on in 4.2 running through the, the different um, locations. I'll just highlight some of the points. For example, for sites adjoining or adjacent to the urban area, the consultation had identified concerns regarding the coalescence of rural settlements within the urban area. And this led to the decision to only identify sites where they can contribute to the delivery of two strategic green infrastructure projects. That is the Bedford River, River Valley Park and the Bedford Milton Keynes Waterway Park. In relation to the transport corridor, um, three alternative levels of growth at Kempston Hardwick were considered. Um, and the rest of the paragraph 4.2 goes on to explain the other areas of work which contributed to informing the development assumptions. As a result, a new long list of 16 options was generated. And these are described in detail in paragraph 4.4 and summarised in table five, which is on page 57. Yeah. Again, it should be noted that urban and urban adjoining components feature in 11 options. Uh, nevertheless, village related growth features in six options and provide a range of all combinations of broad components. The capacity of sites in villages had been assessed to ensure that the amount of growth could be achieved. The differences between the option two variants, just for information, are that option 2A does not include a new settlement component and as a cons consequence requires greater growth focused on Kempston, Hardwick, Stuart B and Wixoms. The 2B, 1, 2 and 3 options only vary in the amount of growth focused on Kempston, Hardwick, Stuart B and Wixoms. Option 2C requires both Y Boston and Little Barford new settlements, but no growth in the transport corridor south. That is the parishes of Wootton, Kempston Rural, Elstow, Wilsted, Shortstown and Cotton End. Option 2D is the only option that requires growth in transport corridor east. That is within the parishes of Cardington, Copal, Willington, Great Barford, Roxton, Y Boston and Little Barford. So moving on to the reasonable alternatives um, to the second part of the question, 
uh, paragraph 4.8 in the development strategy explains the process that was followed. That is, um, that they could provide the required level of housing growth within 10% of the requirement. From the long list of 16 options, 14 options were considered to be reasonable as shown on table six on that page 58. Um, options 1A and 1B were excluded. 1A because it could not meet the required level of growth and 1B because it required growth at an unrealistic density. The decision about reasonableness took account of the council's assessment of all the sites that had been submitted. In selecting the final strategy, the council's decision was based on the sustainability appraisal testing of the reasonable alternatives and an update of the technical studies. Paragraphs 410 to 418 describe the results of the sustainability appraisal testing of the reasonable alternatives. And this showed that the option two variants were the best performing. The update of the technical studies is set out in table seven, which is on page 61 and continues on a few pages. Um, I'll just highlight that transport modelling showed that there were congestion concerns with options three to eight. These are the options which involve village growth and or an A6 corridor new settlement north of Bedford. Paragraph 4.21 provides a clear conclusion and reasons why the strategy was chosen. The option 2B variants were found to be the most appropriate with the option 2B1 variant, which had medium growth at Kempston, Hardwick, Stuartby and Wixom's preferred. Within this option of the two alternatives that make up the new settlement component, growth at Little Barford rather than Wyboston was preferred. And then finally, section five um, sets out the council's reasons, uh, sorry, sets out the council's chosen spatial strategy and gives further information about the reasons for the sites selected for allocation. The strategy aims to minimise the need to travel by car and therefore minimise congestion and carbon dioxide emissions by concentrating growth in accessible locations in and close to Bedford and close to rail stations. East West Rail gives the opportunity for sustainable placemaking based on growth around rail stations. The strategy also seeks to allocate land specifically to foster growth in high value industries, in addition to meeting the assessed need for more traditional industrial and warehousing uses. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for that, that, that helpful, helpful summary. I'm just gonna just gonna go back and pick up on a on a on two or three points if I can do before uh, just points of clarification really before uh, before I open up the uh, floor for others. I'm sure I'm sure we have quite a few people who want to make contributions on this this issue. My my first question was about the uh, the option twos, so the A, B, C, and, and D. Um, so looking and what I have in front of me at the moment is um, page 11, uh, well, it's 11, 12, 13 and 14 of the, uh, of the, um, of the, of the strategy document that you've been referring to. So within that, there is a, an area down as um, uh, Transport. Sorry, if we, if we look at option two two B in particular, where that sets out the various bullets, it includes new settlements at Y Boston or Little Barford, and up to 20, uh, 20 hectares of employment land. The area down as transport corridor, rail based growth, land within the pal parishes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Is that uh, is that bullet there, and is that option? Is that all um, land that we would now recognise as the settlement of? That is, that is proposed at uh, Kempston Hardwick, or does that make up various other bits as well? Um, so this um, this particular option at this stage is the draft plan and decisions hadn't actually been made about this um, individual sites that would make up the strategy that was for the plan for submission. So here it was looking at what the uh, capacity, likely capacity of that area so in effect it would have been a uh, Kempston Hardwick new settlement but we hadn't actually narrowed it down that much at that stage 
Right. Okay. And does that does that follow does that follow through um, that fo that follows through the process? And and at what stage did you start sort of you know recognizing that as what 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 we now know as the Kempston Hardwick new settlement? At the plan for submission stage, um, where we had done the more detailed site appraisal work, um, that's when we um, were able to be more focused about what the development could be, and which is why uh, also why we came up with the variance of one, two, and three to be able to test different amounts of growth um, for that uh, component. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. We we have a specific question on the the treatment of Kempston Kempston Hardwick later in the session. That's just to help me sort of navigate the um the paper. So looking at options um three A B and C, which is the ones uh, where you um talk about the assumptions around um key service centres and rural centre growth. So if we, we if we just focus on the assumptions around those those two bit components of growth. You, I think, mentioned the assumption around 500 for key service centres, and I think was it 35 for rural service centres? Uh, yes, sir. What was what what was underpinning that that assumption? Those two figures. Well, the, the 500 um, represented the amount of growth in a key service centre that the council has assessed as being necessary to support a new primary school. It was incidentally also the, the number we used in the 2030 plan as the allocations for key service centres. It's, it's a useful building block because if you're um, allocating significant growth and there isn't the capacity in an existing school in the village, then it needs to be able to support another school, a new school, and be able to um, provide land to provide it as well. And sorry, the 35? The the 30, yes, the 35 um, is a much smaller number, which we had used in the 2030 plan for rural service centres and was still relevant. It, um, it um, followed on from an assessment of the capacity of existing schools. And um, so it, it represented the amount that we thought that the um, schools would be able to absorb um, without causing too much problem or the schools had scope to um, extend on the site. Yeah, and in terms of your consideration of of the options as you kind of flowed them through the uh, the process, and what and your treatment of key service centres and rural centres, did you did you to work to kind of produce your options on those? Did you assume that um, the the five hundred and the th would be required in all all service centres. So there was it was just a apply five hundred to all of them, and that's your option. Uh, uh, yes, sir. I mean, we um, we didn't want to get into the the realm of selecting some centres and excluding others. That have been a another large piece of work and yeah. potentially quite difficult. But there, was, there was no sort of without identifying there was there was no sort of assumption that you know. You'd only you'd only apply the the assumption to half the centres, and then you'd obviously choose them later. But you know there was no there was no there was no greater sensitivity than assuming that all the centres would accommodate five hundred each, and all the rural centres would accommodate would accommodate thirty five. So there was no there was no chunking up or anything. Um, no, there wasn't, sir. But as you can see in the um, the components, like in, the, in for example, table five on page fifty seven, if you look at the numbers. The, the numbers add up in the um, the village growth to either 4,000 if there's no rural service centres or 4,280, which is quite a significant amount of growth if you were to halve that and, and reallocate 2,000 somewhere else. It's, it actually gets difficult to think where it would go. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you for, uh, th thank you for that. Um, those are oh, the, the, the further question I had was on the, um, uh, on the transport assessment document E2. So can you just take me through in sort of broad terms, how the, the sort of four growth scenarios in the transport assessment sort of overlays and relates to what, what you've just set out? Uh, thank you, sir. I, I hope my colleague Ian Sanis might be able to help on this more than I can. Hello, sir. Hi. Um, I trust you can hear me. 
Yep, I can hear you. Um, so are these the options 2A to 2D? Mm -hmm. Is that the reference here? Uh, so option, so document E2, so that's the transport assessment. My understanding is, and I believe it comes from the, the council's um, hearing statement, that, that that document sort of informed the, uh, the consideration of, of all, all the options, didn't it, rather than just the, the two, two, the ones under two. So it was, it was the main kind of overarching sort of high level assessment that led to, to the choices across all the options rather than just two, and then the more, a series of more specific assessments that were done following that. So Benevolent, document yeah. two talks about sort of four um, sort of broad components. I'm just interested in how that overlays with the um, the other work that's going on that's been set out. Okay, so the, the first stage of the transport modelling looked at four growth scenarios. They were referenced by colours and they were um, dispersed growth, uh, growth in and around urban areas, new settlements, and I think a 4 to one corridor growth. Um, there's, um, there's a table setting them out, yes. Uh, Grey um, was the dispersed growth, pink, yellow, brown, infrastructure focused, which is looking at the A421 corridor, east-west rail. Um, just red and orange option, video. which looked at, the um, at the bottom. new settlements, and then a brown okay, I'll, option, which I'll, looked at urban focus. So they were, we assessed four yes. sort of different scenarios in the transport model, which I think were a subset of the wider options that the council were considering. And then that was taken forward to do a transport assessment of options 2A to 2D. Which was that, and then once that... The top um, right. Once the preferred strategy was uh, determined, that was taken forward and assessed in the transport model. So, so E two was the was the only transport assessment that you had in place when you were considering the wide yeah, I've got, scope of options. Is that is that correct? I've got open so, picture in picture. Yes, I believe so. Yes. A star. Sorry, can, uh, can whoever's speaking put themselves Sorry. on mute, please? Somebody's not on mute. That should be on mute, please. I've got a BedfordWebEx.com. In the HTTPS, in the has that sorted it? Is that into the top of the screen or? Sorry, I believe I believe the individual is actually on the phone with the, with the program officer, so uh, I can't tell the program officer to mute them. So <laughs> we have, yeah, to, uh, to, uh, have to carry on. Um, Yes, yeah, so I was saying, so I understand how it all fits together. The E2 transport assessment was the only transport assessment that you'd done and had in place when you were considering the broader suite of, of options that's been set out. Is that is that correct? Yes, yeah, so there'd been an assessment as well of the individual new settlements sort of in parallel to the, the local so plan that, work. So didn't that follow the E2? That followed the assessment of the, the coloured um yeah. So the pink, yellow, brown, red, but it was ahead of assessing the option 2A to 2D. Okay. But not, so I'm just trying to get my head around the process here because my, get straight in my head, the re, my reading is that the transport assessment you had in place was E2 when you were considering the broad suite of options. But then when you'd selected your preferred options, which were just the ones under option, option two, um, that that was the point at which you started to plug in other transport assessments. Is yeah. that is that incorrect or yes, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to pause there. I do have another couple of questions, but I want to ask um, ask for contributions from other other parties. And as I know, um, I know quite a lot of people raised the question of consideration of reasonable alternatives. So it's the, uh, now's the opportunity to uh, to come in on that for other participants, please. Uh, Mr. Mr. Easton, please, and I, I'll literally just go down as it as it appears on my screen. So apologies if I don't take everybody in order. Good morning, sir. I'm Jonathan Easton, King's Council, representing Rainier Development. So I've I've a couple of uh, of brief points. I know that you've read our hearing statement. Can I just make a general observation to start off with? Um, we don't think it's possible to separate out the realism of delivering the spatial strategy 
from its soundness. And the, the reason we say that is if the spatial strategy is inherently unrealistic or undeliverable, it'd be very difficult to conclude that it's a sound strategy. And in fact, I note that, you, that I, inf I infer from your question three, which we'll come on to in a moment about strategic infrastructure, that you probably agree, sir, that you need to have an you need to have idea about the deliverability, particularly of the large strategic allocations. I know we're going to deal with that deliverability in a different session, but I don't think we can completely divorce the question of the spatial strategy soundness from its deliverability. So that's my first general point. I've got two specific points um, in relation to reasonable alternatives. Um, we note that a number of options were considered by the local authority, but what they appeared to do is th throw a blanket over all villages and particularly key service centres and presumed that they would be unsustainable, particularly in relation to generation of car journeys and emissions. Um, we say that was an exceptionally narrow focus. And to use as an example, my client's site at Bromham, when one looks at the sustainability appraisal, it fares very well. In fact, it compares um, as well, if not better, than a number of strategic allocations when it comes to overall sustainability. So it was an overly narrow focus, we say, in terms of considering different options. Um, the, the next second point, sir, is that there was an obvious reasonable alternative, and it goes back to my introductory point, is that uh, there needs to be some flexibility in the spatial strategy. And the, the difficulty with the council's approach is that a an obvious reasonable alternative would have been rail and infrastructure supported rather than rail based approach with a with contingency or safety net sites to address what we say is the inherent uncertainty and in deliverability of large infrastructure projects such as east west rail and that is would have been and is a reasonable alternative which the uh, local authority should have done but did not consider thank you sir Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, next one, uh, Liberty Stones. Thank you, sir. Um, just a smaller point um, on the uh, rural service settlements. I think that the figure of 35 dwellings was mentioned and the council sort of advised that that was a figure that was taken forward in the local plan 2030. Um, that's not a figure I recognise. The evidence at that point in time um, for the council's local plan 2030, the Bedford development strategy and site selection methodology clearly identified that the rural service um, centres could deliver um, 50 to 150 dwellings and after the neighbourhood allocations in the 2030 plan that sort of still gives capacity for 100 dwellings in those each of those settlements and those are settlements that have existing services and facilities that are up and running that they don't require new services and facilities as per the new settlements do there are also settlements where the school roles are actually falling because of the lack of development in the settlements and an aging um, demographic um, and so you know it, that's just my point in response to that 35 dwellings. But notwithstanding that, of the, the 13 options considered, only four um, so, sort of included growth in the rural service centres. And uh, my view is that that is not really, uh, when assessed as a whole, they allocate the um, distribution they've given of 35 dwellings, but also only considering rural service centres under four of the 13 options, is my view is not sort of reasonable um, and doesn't fully um, reflect what can be delivered in the borough. Thank you. Thank you for that. Before we before we come on to uh, to the next contributor, just uh, just very briefly, as it says, it's on, on, on my mind, as I think Ms Stone's um, Raised uh, raised an issue that, that that was on my mind as well. It was the the five hundred and the thirty five, and obviously the council did did refer to that being some assumptions that were plugged through the local plan twenty thirty process. Could could I ask the council just to produce me a short note just uh, just on that, please? Yes, sir. We we can do that. Thank you. Uh, so rather than virtual hands, we have uh, we have Mr. Mr. Miles with, with an actual hand up. So so to save your actual hand, uh, would you like to speak, Mr. Miles? Uh, 
Yes, uh, uh, I'd like to speak about Elstow, which is a small village opposite Whitsom, divided by the A6. Okay. Uh, how was the loss of agricultural land being adequately considered? Um, as a rural community, farming is historically linked to the village, and the retention of agricultural land and open countryside is important. Uh, we're listed for a potential 400 houses uh, on what is now uh, a farm, pear tree farm. The loss of the swathe of this land for the various planning policies in Elston alongside the A6 would be detrimental, we feel, for this area south of Bedford. Uh, th thank you for that, uh, Mr. Mr. Harris. Please, sorry, Mr. Mr. Miles. Well, well, I've got you. As you had your actual hand up. Um, have, I have you attended yes, the training? Yes, I do apologise. I can't see how I can do the other hand. Uh, oh, don't don't worry. If you look, uh, if you look at the bottom of your screen next to the word share, you'll find a uh, oh. you'll find a little hand that says raise hand. Okay. Can you see that? Uh, if it's the same as me. Oh my gosh! Yes. Yeah. So that's um that that should shed, should save your arm. Yes, you, my you. lord. Okay, I do apologise for that. I do now. Don't, see you, it. Don't, don't you worry at all. Don't you worry at all. Um, okay, Mr. Uh, Mr. Harris, please. Thank you, sir. Um, yes, yeah, just following on from the, uh, the the first two speakers, obviously we have got concerns with regards to. Um, how the development strategy has treated sort of the key service centres. Um, Obviously, it helpfully set out in Table 5 of the development strategy, where um, village-related is six of the various options, but those options range from 28% uh, of the whole of the, the housing requirement through to 41%. So, you know, we're not advocating that level of development um, as the most sustainable option, but our concern is that Obviously, the, the plan um, has sort of focused more on new settlements and rather than looking at the urban area and the higher order um, large sustainable villages in conjunction with the new settlements. And we just feel as if it's a very blunt tool. So I think your question to the council earlier as to, well, you, you've just assessed eight settlements with 500 dwellings each. And the answer was, well, the 500 dwellings each is for education. Um, by way of example, our clients did obviously an application in Wooten a couple of years ago. You know, education wasn't an issue, wasn't a reason for refusal. Um, so really, you know, the, the council really should be assessing or setting out evidence as to why 500 dwellings is necessary in each of these locations. But it should have a much more finer grade assessment of each settlement, you know, assessing what are the schools, what are the other services and facilities in these villages, and what um, level of development might be a, a, might be suitable. So, for example, taking Wooden, for example, it might be 200 or 300. Some settlements might, might be different. But I just feel as if the, uh, the development strategy and the sustainability assessment has just sort of ign or not ignored, but it has assessed, but it's been dismissed, that option has been dismissed based on assuming 500 dwellings across each of the eight settlements and a much more finer grain assessment should have been undertaken really, looking at each settlement before looking to um, allocate large areas of development in close proximity to existing villages, which may then impact on their vitality and viability going forward as well. So, um, so I'll go back to what Mr. Easton was saying earlier. Um, that seems to be a very reasonable alternative that should have been considered um, going forward. And um, the, the second point was obviously the new settlement option was looking to develop a strategy the least popular through the consultation process. Yeah, that's the one that's been sort of taken forward. So contrary to sort of the general consultation um, process, that's sort of the feeling across the across the borough seems to be ignored as well. So that concludes my points. And obviously I've set those out in greater detail as part of our representations. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. As as we've heard, I believe for or to give all sort of the opportunity to to respond. Um I'll I'll take uh, I'll take uh, uh, now.
get for doing so. I think it's Mr. Eastern and also the last contributor as well. I also think um, did sort of hit hit on the issue that I was trying to get at. I think Mr. Eastern's word is you've, you've thrown a blanket it's over the key to rural services, um, making sort of the assumption that all will accommodate you know, the maximum 500 rather than sort of chunking it up and saying, you know, only a certain certain proportion could, you, you've not done a fine, a fine grain enough assess of those. Um, that's put you in a tricky position in terms of putting forward that rely heavily on strategic infrastructure with all the complications that come along with that. How do you, how do you respond to that accusation? Thank you, sir. Um... I would, um, on the risk of straying onto some of your other questions, I, I would point out that the um, the 2040 plan builds on the 2030 plan, and the 2030 plan did have a strategy which involved development in rural areas in the villages, and we feel that in this new strategy, it's appropriate to allow time for those. Um, significant allocations in those villages to assimilate before more development is allocated and, and some of those sites will be building uh, throughout the uh, first half of the plan period up into the 2030s. Um, we believe that the, the strategy we have chosen is the, the best strategy as uh, it focuses growth in the most accessible locations. It's a rail based strategy and um, um, and, and a strategy it has to make a decision between sites um, so that um, the best sites are chosen. Thank, thank you, sir. Th th thank you for that. Um, anything to say on the other contributions? We have Mr. Miles talking about the um, loss of agricultural land, and we, we had uh, the points from from Mr. Easton as well. And Ms. Uh, 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 Ms. Stones. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, the. Um... The loss of agricultural land, um, I think, is a matter which we um, dealt with in some detail in our um, assessment. Uh, sorry, our written submission to you um, to the to the inquiry, it's, which was um, just trying to find the question actually. No, uh, it's question five. Yeah, and we dealt with that in quite some detail. But in in summary, we we have tried to avoid um, the loss of agricultural land wherever possible. It is an important consideration for the council. Um, we have allocated sites where we can within the urban area, um, and on brownfield land where it is possible outside the urban area. Unfortunately, that is not enough to to meet the level of growth which um, we are required to provide and it's inevitable therefore that there will be some development in uh, agric on agricultural land and greenfield sites we have tried to avoid the the best uh, agricultural land grade one quality uh, unfortunately there is some as set out in our statement but uh, we have made our best efforts to um, to deal with avoiding the agricultural land loss of agricultural land Okay. Um, in relation to the um, the point raised raised by Liberty uh, Stones for Richborough, um, I think that would probably be covered in our note to you, uh, sir. Um, but uh, suffice to say, the the fifty to one hundred and fifty number she mentions, are, I don't recognise. Um, we think it might have been at regulation 18 stage for the 2030 plan. The actual plan for submission and the adopted plan had a range of 25 to 50 in the rural service centres and the 35 was used as an average figure. Um, which, so that was just for convenience, really. Yeah. Um, just in terms of Mr. Easton's point about flexibility of the spatial strategy, I do I do have questions on that later in the in the agenda. So I would like to come on to that specifically. I've, uh, so um, if you can save the response to that until, until that will be good. Okay. Okay. Anything you'd like to say before I uh, carry on with the contributions? Uh, no, sir. Okay, Mr. Uh, Mr. Goodall, please. Morning, sir. Can you hear me? Okay. 
I can. Perfect. It's uh, John Goodall, DLP for Bedfordia, Bedfordshire Charitable Trust and Meridian Trust for their specific interests in Oakley. Um, so you've got under this question, you've got a point on whether the selection of new settlements introduced weakness to the assessment process is under this item. So you're happy if I make those points now. You did suggest you'd return to new settlements, but it's under this number, so I can cover it all in one go. If that's easier. Uh, no, I think that probably that sits better. I think in the uh, in the next item, I think. Yeah, I think that that sits. Yeah, we got item four. Oh no, no, we haven't. The, the bullet is under yes. this one, so I'm, I'm completely MIQ happy where it is. Yeah, yeah. So I'll be returning to that on MIQ six, and particularly the the issue of Kempston Hardwick. I'll be talking about th that. Okay. Point. So my my final point will be better picked up there, sir. But one naturally follows into the other. Um, we welcome your additional work on the the suggestion of the note from the council. Um, I. Our position, so was, I think there'd be us and others who would actually welcome the opportunity to comment on that, but obviously leave that one for you, sir. The council absolutely did test a wider range than 35 to 500 units in, in as Mr. Tidy said, the Regulation 18 version of its um, 2030 local plan, which itself, itself lacked flexibility in the full provision to meet housing need. So this flexibility point has been raised before. Um, and I'm sure I'm sure there'll be ourselves and others who will want to take you to that reference. Um, but it, it isn't sound, sir, for the council to say that it'd be too difficult for the count for the council to have looked below the four thousand two hundred and eighty number. That's expressly what paragraph 60, 68, and sixty six of the MPPF would all require in terms of putting together a sound spatial strategy, um, and one that provides that necessary flexibility. Um, so I've got three specific points, sir. And the first one is one that you made under the testing of the option twos. Now, I think you've quite rightly raised the issue of Kempston Hardwick, sir, and that does introduce a weakness, which we'll we'll come on to later in terms of the assumptions for delivery of that particular site. Our issue all along with option two, though, is that the council's components don't make sense. So in option D, a 2D, for example, which was tested, or option 2A, they all include transport corridor south growth or transport corridor east growth. Now, fundamentally, that is village related growth, which the council then goes on to say is unsustainable. But it gives you a different starting point in terms of how you should then view the 4,280 number. And the council simply hasn't done that. There are no criteria to look at those villages different to the other service centres. Um, and that could have been a reason to rule out. Uh, that doesn't give you any reason then, sir, to rule out any of those sites that are listed against those settlements where the council's given you the long list that we went through earlier in the week for the sustainability appraisal. Um, and it then also means that you should be dealing with a number that's different to 4,280 units when you look at the rural settlements outside of those two parishes, which themselves are also sustainable and part of the council's existing sustainable spatial strategy. And again, it rules out the basis for, for any further testing. Um, now, we would say you know, sites at the urban edge, which fall part of those reasonable, reasonable alternatives from the council's spatial strategy, they should all be assessed in detail through the council's healer. They shouldn't be ruled out as unsustainable. Um, they should be subject to further iterative testing. Um, there's a slightly, slightly perverse point there as well, so where the council says that it's difficult to rule out settlements. Well, actually, there are some settlements that fall within those parishes where, having looked at your strategic sites, you could quite rightly take the decision to rule them out. And I'll use the example of Wilstead, which didn't take any growth under the local plan 2030 because of its proximity to Wixom's. Logically, you could make the same decision again in this plan. That doesn't mean that there will never be any further growth in Wilstead, but it could easily mean that it falls out of the 4,280 number because of its relationship to, to the Bedford South Grove area, for example. Um, 
my second point is a brief one and really it it follows on from that point that having having said this you've got no basis through the conclusions of the development strategy topic paper or how the option twos have been set out to know that the 4280 number is the right one or that therefore the the villages themselves couldn't have been looked at differently as mr harris said below and mr easton below the 500 number so that really takes me into a point that the work that the council's done it, it doesn't give you any it, it doesn't give you any information to say that any of the sites identified um are unsuitable and the healer process and the development strategy process should have gone further in looking at those sites um it's only then that you get to a point of saying well what are their character characteristics or otherwise for their suitability and my third and final point is one where that methodology should be applied with reference to sites in the Bedford urban edge um but as I say the issue applies across the board for it's fatal if you get option two wrong and you don't understand what is village growth and what isn't village related growth in terms of how you you've identified and iteratively tested your reasonable alternatives you have failed in terms of showing that you've iteratively tested all sites but to and I'm afraid it doesn't pick an example at random sir it our client has interests at Green End Kempston which are next door to the Gibraltar Corner site, which this council has selected. There is no further testing of that site within the healer process, because as Mr. Tidy said, it's only a development strategy topic paper function that the council has said, well, we think there's a coalescence issue. The healer doesn't tell you what the coalescence issue is for that site or any other Bedford Urban Edge site because they've ruled them out on the sole criterion of the green infrastructure point. But also the healer doesn't assess the green infrastructure contribution of our client site, which, as I say, is right next door to Gibraltar Corner. It is overlain by part of the uh, Marston Vale planting proposals that can be emitted for the developable area. It's one of multiple examples in the urban edge where that full assessment through the healer should have been done. But because of the way the council's approached its development strategy, it's ruled out saying that it, it needs to do that or that it could provide flexibility by doing that. I'd say further to our submissions on on matter one, sir, and the SA, that's why this process is fundamentally unsound and not compliant in terms of the SA process. OK, thank you. Uh, Mr Agnew. So can you hear me? I can. Yeah, Richard Agnew at Gladman. I suppose much of what I wanted to say has been covered by previous participants, so I'll try to be brief. And I suppose it's covered in the point of flexibility that we'll come to in terms of the reasonable alternatives and the all or nothing to the villages. And Mr. Tiny said that they'd find it difficult to how they could apportion that to less settlements, so for example, in the key service centres. And it does come to that flexibility point and it's tallied up with what we call unrealistic delivery assumptions of their strategic sites and how there could be a crossover of development at the key service centres complementing the key serve of the excuse me the strategic sites but I suppose we'll come on to that discussion a bit later on. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Mr Freer. Thank you, sir. Um, Likewise, there's a, a number of points around the key settlement centres, which I uh, won't repeat now. Others have made similar remarks, um, but mine uh, has a slightly different angle in relation to that as to how the chosen uh, strategies have been both assessed and concluded, um, particularly in relation to some of the sustainability objectives that were set out. I suppose my first point uh, would be uh, the extent to which the choice of strategy is closely connected with the uh, the vision uh, and the overall aspirations for the strategy. Part of this becomes, I suppose, a little bit chicken and egg, uh, and Mr. Tidy in outlining lots and lots of different options that have been considered, essentially, I think, made the point that the building block for those was uh, at the bottom end of the strategy, if you like, in essence, what sites were available, rather than, if you like, the vision at the top end uh, and the objective in relation to that. Um, so the vision we recall um, it set out in the plan is includes many different aspects of delivering what's in the plan. 
but it also has this clear commitment uh, to ensuring that we have the most sustainable communities, uh, whether that's new build uh, communities or whether it's existing communities uh, that uh, needs to be followed through into the strategy uh, in relation to that. Uh, DS2 is also clear that, um, uh, DS1, sorry, is also very clear that in minimising carbon emissions, the first objective or first policy in the plan really um, is all about uh, being located, development being located so as to minimise the need to travel and where there are opportunities to make those abilities by non motorised vehicle, uh, non motorised um, uh, modes. Uh, likewise, contributing to more walkable and cyclable neighbourhoods. So the overarching framework for the option, so to speak, uh, which you could have perhaps driven the process in a slightly different way as to which are the ones that immediately satisfy that, those being the initial building block rather than what sites are available, uh, would seem to be key to that process. So I worry a little bit that what we've ended up with is a strategy that um, is a little disconnected, if you like, uh, firstly from those uh, original objectives, because we've sent, ended up with something that you're going to come on to that is a little bit uh, inflexible, binary, exclusive, um, a limited number of sites in Bedford, two sites on the edge of Bedford joining, and then the A4, A421 corridor. So. Uh, fairly binary choices at the end of the day, um, which amount to a really big switch in the strategy that you will that you debated the other day around trajectories and things. So we end up with DS2 that for the rural areas, the strategy is the completion of the last plan rather than uh, the completion of the key service centre um, strategy from the last plan, rather than setting out a strategy for a long period ahead for till 2040. Of course, in the last plan, some of the key service centres didn't have any uh, development particularly within them. So that would amount to relatively limited amounts of development coming forward. I suppose the option so far as uh, that may or may not have been explored as part of that is the uh, is what I would call um, the concern is that we lose real sustainability uh, options to pursue real sustainability uh, opportunities. Uh, some colleagues in the examination have already referenced places that they consider would be sustainable options um, and the fact that the strategy effectively limits or restricts those. The more general category, although I have a particular interest in one location, uh, Declaration, Clapham, uh, the more general, I suppose, point around that is that there will be well-connected, sustainable, multimodal, uh, connected locations um, that comply with the vision, that comply with the S1, uh, that are precluded from coming forward as part of the strategy. And the particular point I want to raise that I don't think others have, albeit maybe it's implicit uh, in what they say, uh, is in relation to Bedford itself and the sort of the idea of a greater Bedford um, uh, focus for the strategy. Uh, Mr. Tidy said in selecting the strategies at the end of the day, uh, uh, I think it was his words, he'll correct me, I'm sure, in response, if that wasn't the case, was that it was the urban area and the adjoining urban, urban areas were the, the most sustainable options. Uh, they were the focus for, uh, they would ideally be the focus for that. In the end, what we've ended up with is relatively limited provision in the urban area, 1,200 dwellings, 1,500 in two locations on the edge, um, and a fairly, and a very tight definition of um, of the Bedford area that is the most sustainable option according to the strategy uh, in the area. Uh, Clapham, less than three kilometres from the uh, railway station, connected by cycles, footways, uh, other settlements are well connected to Bedford in which much emphasis be is being placed in reinforcing the infrastructure of the station. Uh, investment in the town centre, investment in other aspects of it to reinforce further its sustainability. And so the, uh, there are real locations on related settlements, Clapham I say is one, uh, which um, are closely linked to uh, the town centre that are really excluded uh, from closely related to the most sustainable strategy because they're well related, they're connected, they have opportunities. 
On the education side, just as an aside in Clapham, uh, other development is coming forward with a, uh, I think, one form entry school, but with an opportunity to extend it. Clapham and in the existing school, there are opportunities to extend. So there are opportunities to uh, deliver uh, the infrastructure for the benefit of the community, not just simply to accommodate or mitigate uh, development. So to conclude, sorry, because I've probably talked too long already, uh, the strategy in DS2 doesn't talk about, it talks about within the urban area of which there are limited opportunities. Then it says strategic specific sites on the edge of the urban area, which is Gibraltar Corner and the River Valley Park, uh, and the employment locations at Goldington Road. So they are two locations only, essentially, sorry, three, including the employment locations. So there are opportunities uh, associated with, um, and I can't see why a strategy that identifies Bedford and its immediate environs and well-connected locations would not include well-connected, uh, functionally related uh, locations um, wherever they are located in and immediately beyond the boundaries of Bedford to be included uh, within that strategy because they would most closely accord with the sustainability appraisal work. Uh, in addition, that then helps your vision objective to support existing communities, your DS1 objectives to support cycle, ped, walkable neighbourhoods, uh, because places like Clapham fulfil all of those uh, obligations. So just to conclude, uh, and maybe there's further points on flexibility later on, I would have thought in an ambitious plan, which in some respects it certainly is, uh, delivery is a, an interesting question about uh, ambition, but in an ambition plan that's looking to grow um, its, um, its uh, housing need by 40%, um, then it seems strange that you would adopt fairly binary strategies that preclude highly sustainable options. We should be looking to achieve all of those highly sustainable options, which I say one of the best ways of dealing with that is giving a generic general uh, support to uh, growth within the greater Bedford area, including such key settlements as, uh, as Clapham, uh, because these will not only help achieve the ambition and they will give much more uh, comfort in delivering uh, than the scale of ambition, and they are delivering the most sustainable options that the council has identified as part of its uh, process. Uh, that's probably far more than you needed or wanted to hear from me, so uh, forgive me for that. Uh, um, that's, that's all I've got to say at the moment. That's okay, Mr. Freer, I'll dock you time in later matters. Fine. <laughs> Uh, okay, I want to bring uh, I want to bring MIQ three to 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 an end. As as people have alluded to, we have a, a lengthy agenda, and there's some some repetition. My, my uh, within the matters, my expectation there is that people won't make the same points over and over, and we'll we'll find an appropriate time to uh, to put their uh, to, to 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 include their comments. But what what I'll do is I'll just ask the the council to sort of final sum on what they've heard on MIQ three, and then what what we'll do is we'll pause for a uh, for a break there, please. Thank you, sir. Um, I'll just uh, conclude by commenting that the um, the council was um, took account of the 2030 plan and the allocations in the existing villages, and was very much concerned to ensure that that growth had time to assimilate before more development was allocated. Um, some sites in those villages, indeed, are quite. Um, well performing in, in terms of the sustainability appraisal. Um, they have many uh, features which uh, are quite admirable, but the council chose a strategy which is rail based and um, believes that the strategy as set out in the plan is the most sustainable strategy and sites have been allocated in the most sustainable locations. And in particular in relation to the villages in the um, which fall within the A421 corridor which have been mentioned um, the council was very keen to select growth which would be near to a station such as at adjoining Wixom's um, which is where um, a significant amount of that growth has um, been allocated thank you sir Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you for that. We'll uh, we'll pause there for a break. It's twenty five to to twelve. So if we can have a a fifteen minute break and come back at ten to uh, ten to twelve, please. Thank you.
Hello there. I can see Mr. Bird on screen. Hello. Hello, sir. Okay, so we're moving on with uh, item three on the agenda, which is around uh, strategic infrastructure. So um, obviously this is a, an infrastructure led plan. So having a, having an item on strategic infrastructure under the uh, the spatial strategy session, I think, is entirely appropriate. But what obviously what I what I would caution that with is that uh, obviously we're going to be considering each allocation individually, and each of those has varying degrees of infrastructure reliance to them, which we'll come on to uh, to sort of consider in in. Um, in due course. So this really is is about the sort of wider approach to strategic infrastructure and the key bits of infrastructure, which the council say are, you know, the entire plan and the, the, the spatial strategy is really is really dependent on. So um, the council statement as set out in paragraph uh, 7.9. So, so the council have identified three pieces of uh, absolutely key bits of uh, of infrastructure that drove their choice of spatial strategy. Indeed, they say at paragraph para, paragraph seven point nine of the hearing statement that the plan provision of these items of strategic infrastructure was instrumental in the decision to focus growth on the transport corridor containing both East West Rail and the A four two one A four two eight. So, as I've said, different allocations have different levels of reliance, and we'll go through those as we go through piece by piece. But I, I wanted to sort of hover at this stage on, on those three pieces of strategic infrastructure in particular to sort of look at the sort of latest position on, on each um, and uh, and consider those. So, so starting with um, with East West Rail, so the point to A. So we have the council's the council statement on on East West Rail, which is of course has been overtaken by events, as they say. Um, so, can the can the council just give me the, the sort of latest um, latest position as they understand it on East West Rail, please? And so, yes, it's Mr. Shortland. Just before he starts, so can I just be quite sure? I th think we have skipped over one item under item two, which was MIQ six, the new settlement Apple. question. Have we really? Oh, we have. I am missing a, I'm missing a page from my, from my papers. Just bear with me a second. Oh, I do apologize. Strategic infrastructure. Apologies. I'm just going to need a second just to uh, grab. I think something came off the printer in the wrong order. With you in a second. Okay, thanks, sir. Apologies, I've got that in front of me now. I'm. Uh, I made the. Uh, I made the error of when sending. Uh, when sending my printing through, not putting page numbers on them, so it came up in a slightly different. Uh, different. Different way. So apologies for that. I, I did jump ahead in the agenda. We are coming on to MIQ, MIQ six now, which is around decision the principal generation of new, new, new settlements. Uh, and specifically, I asked a question from the settlements camp uh, why that wasn't included in the new settlement uh, assessment document H two. 
uh, specifically asking the question about whether or not that introduced any weaknesses into the um, into the overall assessment of option. I obviously have the have the council's response to to that, but uh, if I can start by asking the council to introduce that that item, please. And apologies again for the for the mix up. No, sorry, sir. Uh, uh, Mr. Tidy is going to address. Thank you, sir. Um, I'll, I'll keep this quite brief, sir, because um, it is set out in the council statement. The, uh, and to put it briefly, the new settlements assessment paper looked at the information that was submitted by the promoters of new settlements. Kempston Hardwick was not promoted as a new settlement by the landowner, which is why it was not included in that paper. However, as we can see from the development strategy, if, again, if you turn to page 57, the table five I've previously referred you to, you can see that uh, new settlements did form one of the strategy's five broad components of growth. Um, and the uh, Kempston Hardwick features in the A421 transport corridor with, along with rail-based growth focused on the planned stations at Kempston Hardwick and Stewartby. So in the generation of strategy alternatives, it was clear that there needed to be a significant amount of growth in the rail corridor in order to meet the assessed total housing need. And the, the obvious place for this growth was in association with the new rail station planned at Kempston Hardwick. It subsequently became equated with being a new settlement in its own right, in addition to the separate new settlements component of growth, given that the new settlement model was the best means to ensure a good form of development for this amount of growth. Uh, no weakness is introduced into the assessment of options. Kempston Hardwick was assessed in the healer in just the same way as the other new settlement alternatives and using the same criteria. That's all, sir. Okay, so, so where are you say in your statement, uh, paragraph 6.2, that document H2 was, um, uh, document H2, the new settlements assessment was produced to be able to form an objective comparison between the promoted sites. Um, accepting what you say about uh, about Kempston Hardwick not not necessarily being a, a promoted site, does that mean are you, are you still asserting that an objective comparison has been carried out between all the new settlement options, even though it's not included? So the the objective comparison is um, included in the healer. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps the the choice of words in uh, paragraph six point two is 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 ambiguous because what it did was set the promoted sites side by side so you could see what was submitted in relation to them uh, the the um the new set uh, the new settlement decision as to which to be allocated was taken in as part of the the strategy um, consideration uh, which is when Kempton hardwick fits in as well as as i previously explained so so is the main with the settlement settlement which does does what it does uh, you obviously drew my attention to the healer and appendix five is that is that is that the source of objective assessment of all of all the the actual new settlement options against each other uh yes it is sir yeah so that, that that's where i should be you should be looking for for that comparison between them all rather than h2 which is which is just the, the promoted sites is that how i should be viewing that's this? right so yes okay so my next uh, my next question was about the the transport assessments um and uh and for, for this if i can ask you to get open the probably most useful document is document ed7 which is the non-technical summary of, of documents that i asked the council to um to produce for the examination have you um have you got that in front of you? Or can you get it in front of you? Excuse me, sir. I'll take a moment and just find it. Don't worry.
it's a ed7 so it's an examination document rather than a rather than the evidence document yes sir i have it in front of me i found it okay great so if you the final two pages of that it's obviously quite a short document anyway but we have the overview of the um of the bedford borough local plan assessment at figure 3.1 and then we have um we have paragraph 3.1 which precedes that which gives us a gives what i found to be a sort of helpful overview of the various transport assessments that had been done at various stages of a plan uh, a plan preparation so that was a, that, that, that's a really helpful overview um i think so at the back of the assessments uh, the uh, on that particular table there i see that you did um uh, for, for under the large development assessments spring 2021 you did um you did transport assessments for Den denny brook um which is the the land west of y boston isn't it is that yes right, that sorry. was at denny brook yeah. um little barford uh, Twin Woods and Colmworth. So those are at documents E3 to E5. Is it right that it, when you looked at transport assessments, the Kempston Hardwick um, new settlement was only looked at um, as part of a, a broader, a broader kind of growth component rather than sort of looked at in its in its own right, like the other new ses uh, settlements were? I, I believe it was, sir. I'm not an expert on transport matters, but I believe that is the answer. And obviously that's taking a broader look rather than a specific look at, you know, the issues around that particular new new settlement. So I guess, I guess my question following on from that, as you can probably anticipate, is does, does that introduce any weakness into uh, into how transport assessments have been have been done and looked at in comparison to each other? Um, I think I'm going to have to defer to uh, my transport colleague. Oh, why, oh, why doesn't it? More, more question. <laughs> Um, I, I, I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer this, sir, but perhaps my colleague can assist me with this. Thank you. Um, well, um, from a, a transport, well, I, I suppose at that stage of the local plan work, we were asked by Bedford to assess those four developments. Um, and as you say, the Kempston Hardwick. So just to so clear there, the, the four assessments being uh, um, Denny Brook, which West of Y Boston, Little Barford, Trinwoods, yeah. and Colworth. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, my understanding is that Kempston Hardwick came into our transport modelling as part of the emerging preferred options assessment in summer 2021. So it came in a slightly different route and has been subject to a, to a different sort of type of assessment to the to the other new settlements. Yes. Yeah. So it hasn't been assessed in the same way as the other new settlements. Uh, not in the transport modelling, no. Okay. So in your in your sort of professional experience, does that does that cause a problem? Is that a problem? Um, I wouldn't say so. The level of work undertaken for the large development assessments is not to the level that you would undertake for a transport assessment as part of a planning application. And so should Kempston Hardwick come forward, assuming it does, they would need to be submitting a transport assessment and doing further work in due course. Yeah, but what we're talking about here is the choice of spatial strategy yeah. and the, the decisions were reached at to go for the different new settlements. And what, what's been put to me is that they've all been subject to the same level of assessment and they've and comparative analysis. But in transport terms, it looks like actually they haven't. Uh, if I might come in at that point, sir. Um, Please do. The overall assessment which we undertook, uh, which included Kemps and Hardwick, means that they have all now been assessed at the same level. Um, whilst that one wasn't assessed individually earlier in the process, the the, uh, the overall position now is that all of the schemes in the in the uh, um, in the in the local plan have all been assessed and worked together. Yeah, but in terms of the flow of spatial options and how they worked through in terms of you having four settlement options in front of you, 
um, and considering which was the which was the the best one to go in transport terms, presumably you'd be looking at mitigation associated with the beach. And indeed, mitigation was a key reason for rejecting Conworth and the the other one to the to the north, wasn't it? So I guess what I'm trying to get at here is, you know, accepting what you say there, Mr. Shortland. Actually, did that assessment that you're referring to actually come in at the point actually when you'd already um, you'd already discounted? Two, um, two new settlement locations. Um, so actually, can you can you really say that they'd all been subject to a on the level objective assessment? Yes, I think we can. when we looked at the mitigation that was necessary, um, we found that there were junctions which were over capacity in the north of Bedford for which no mitigation could be found. Whereas the junctions to the south of Bedford were sites where mitigation could be found, and that is what directed us to Kempston Hardwick rather than Colworth and Twinwoods. Yep. Okay. But I think what we're talking about here is the timing of when choices were made, um, rather than the actual conclusions of the of the assessment. So you know what information was before you at various times that led you to make spatial choices about which strategy was the right one to adopt and which one was rejected. And what's been put to me is that they've all been subject to the same level of analysis and all the information was available at the same time. But it, it sounds like there's a slight disconnect between. Kempston Hardwick and the point at which that was actually looked at in transport assessment terms or how it was treated. Um, and I, it's obviously a very, a very, very complicated point, or you know, it's obviously a new point that I've, I've sprung upon you. So it's, it's only fair that I give you the opportunity to sort of mull over that issue and and give a give some thought to it. So if you want to take it away and produce a, a note or whatever and and go th go through the, the process, then that, that's absolutely fine. Do take the opportunity to do that. Um because it is key that I understand that you know how how the new treatments are how the new settlements have been treated and that I'm clear that they've been sort of um been been subjected to the same level of analysis at the same time. Um, so do, do you want to take that away? We or will do you avail feel, ourselves of that yeah, opportunity. Thank you. Probably a good idea to do yeah. rather than sort of try and respond. I do appreciate it. it is a it is a new a new thing. I suppose. <laughs> so um, please uh, please please do. Okay. So um, and I think I understand the rationale. I mean, I've obviously read the assessments relating to Colworth and Twinwoods. I understand why they were, uh, why the rationale for for re rejecting rejecting those. So I, I don't have any specific questions on um, on those. The the final point that I have before sort of opening this issue up to a question. I know Mr. Goodall said that he had a specific thing that he wanted to say on this this issue. Um, is the uh, looking at the new settlement, looking at the um, uh, looking at the uh, the strategy topic paper and the reasons for rejecting option two uh, two C, which is the one where you had two new settlements, one at Y Boston and one at Little Barford. Um, so the reasoning given for rejecting those those two so close to each other was that you had concerns about the ability of the housing market to deliver simultaneously. Um, do those do those concerns not also apply to Little Barford and Kempston Hardwick? Um, obviously, they're not right next to each other, but they're in the same they're in the same they're in the same borough, aren't they? So, and they're they're due to deliver at the same time. So, do you have sort of any evidence that you know having them delivering simultaneously is a is a realistic aspiration? Uh, so, I'm not <laughs> I'm not sure we have um, any evidence, but we feel they are different housing markets uh, to some extent in that Little Barford is very close to the borough boundary and so we'll um, have a, a greater draw from the east towards Cambridge and St Neots area whereas Great um, Kempton Hardwick of course is uh, very close to Bedford urban area. So we think that um, is a sufficient dif differentiation to enable them to deliver. Okay, so so you think they they sort of obviously they're geographically for, for, further away, and you think that they're they're essentially serving two slightly different housing markets that so they won't compete with each other. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. Um, so on MIQ six, I'll invite contributions from uh, from other people. Please, I'll start with Mr. Goodall as you uh, as you, you you warmed me up previously for it. 
can you hear me sir thank you yeah sorry for being a bit, sorry for being a bit gentle in introducing the missing bullet but i'm grateful mr bird's clarified it as well yeah it's really a very simple point it, it's one of iterative testing and the reason that treating kempston hardwick in the way it has been is a is a it's a failure of the the sa process again and the iterative testing um those sites weren't called a new settlement under option two and the way in which option two was presented as i said previously you know those sites were discrete submissions at that point in time and the way in which the transport corridor south parishes were treated at that time was again discrete and it's only at a later stage where the council you know whatever the ultimate reasons had it done its work on a comparable basis would or wouldn't have been for selecting growth in that location is the result of iterative testing to effectively generate why those sites comprise a new settlement option i, I think we're all you know we all share concerns over the realism of its delivery they, they are separate questions for another day but they arise as a result of iterative testing and the healer process that mr tidy refers to takes forward that iterative testing on a comparable basis um and you can see through the council's testing of option eight that what they've effectively then tried to do is is look at the transport south area diff the, the, the bedford south area differently and they've said right well we've tested bedford south with the village related growth so what option do two does uh, what option what option eight does is effectively shows the villages alongside the, the the bedford south area more or less as it's presented in the plan but again that's a it, it it's ultimately so it's a failure of iterative testing because having done that work for the Kempston new settlement, Kempston Hardwick new settlement, why not do that for how you've tested the other options more flexibly, you know, for, for the village related component across the board, but fundamentally in having tested Kempston Hardwick iteratively, as I'll say again, the 4,280 number changes, you don't look at all parishes from that point onwards. Um, and you could have tested, you could have and needed to test the whole strategy in more detail. And that's why it's a weakness in the process, sir, that if you can test one part of the strategy iteratively to get to a, a um get to a point where you can select Kempston Hardwick, that's not the same as saying that your strategy overall is appropriate. And it, it's not a question for the council saying that this is the most appropriate strategy. Fundamentally, if we've still got concerns over delivery and the soundness of the strategy as a whole as it's been presented even after that work then the strategy isn't an appropriate one and that's why there's a weakness and the whole process needed to be, to have been subject to iterative testing um, and this is just an illustration of that okay thank you mr goodall um uh Ms. hillman please hi lindsay and gamble for central bedfordshire council um I just kind of wanted to, well, we've set out obviously our, our key points in our written reps and the hearing statements, and obviously we don't want to repeat what we said there, but just wanted to kind of just give a high level summary of our, our thoughts on the principal and general locations of the new settlements. Um, we do have concerns about the focus of the, the growth to the south and east of Bedford and the implications that, that would have on our residents and communities within central Bedfordshire, um, particularly as the two strategic highway routes that would serve the growth directly route into central Bedfordshire. Um, we don't feel that the cross boundary highway impacts or the implications of the level of growth proposed um, on the have been considered properly on the wider strategic road network and they haven't really been appropriately reflected in this plan as submitted. Um, obviously, we recognise that the council's ambition for, for rail based growth strategy and obviously you'd have seen from our statements previously that our concerns um, kind of also centred around the identification of proposed strategic allocations when there were so many uncertainties around the delivery of key strategic transport infrastructure. Obviously, that included East West Rail. Um, obviously, we'll come on to this more in greater detail tomorrow under Matter 6. Um, but obviously, the recent announcement of the East West Rail preferred route um, and the identification of a new station at Tentsford obviously now raises concerns from our perspective about the sustainability of a location such as Little Barford and the potential for even further impact on the strategic and local road network, given that the settlement wouldn't be directly rail served. Um, like I said, we'll obviously discuss that in greater detail tomorrow, but we do feel that if, if the policy for Little Barford is taken forward, it would need to be modified um, to ensure the provision of sustainable travel links to the station at its proposed new location. And we feel that that's something that kind of needs to be discussed and clarified at, at this stage. 
Um, Thank you. Thank you. I'm just just to clarify, the matter six session is next Tuesday. It's not tomorrow. Sorry, I meant next Tuesday. I'm really... no, yes, I did. No, that, no, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't supposed to be somewhere. But, no, uh... no, that's me entirely. Um, I suppose again, also as obviously set out in opposition statements, um, we we don't consider that the location of the proposed growth and the impacts on the wider strategic road network has been considered sufficiently. Um, and as I kind of alluded to yesterday, we have the view that the the wider strategic impacts um, within Bedford need to be considered in the wider context. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of discussion um, and information in the plan about the 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 arc context, um, and we kind of feel that that wider um, position needs to be considered from a transport perspective as well. Um, obviously, as Mr. Shortland um, identified yesterday, there are discussions that are ongoing with national highways and and central beds and, and Milton Keynes councils um, about the the wider strategic um, impacts. Um, but to date, no actual strategic solutions have been identified. And we just feel that there's a danger that if the delivery of the proposed growth at the locations set out in the, 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 the proposed plan for Bedford um, are taken forward without the consideration of the wider impacts on the strategic road network um, and obviously contributions to essential mitigation, that it will essentially push like the onus onto those who come after this plan to resolve those issues, um, which obviously this growth would be significantly contributing to. Um, so uh, we, we're going to come on to, uh, in fact, we, we've got an agenda item later later today on cross boundary impacts. But as the as I just spoke about transport assessments, and you're on screen, I'll ask the question now. So um, th th those assessments obviously consider the issue of of, miti of mitigation. Um, how do you feel in terms of how how you've been involved in the development of those, and whether or not they adequately re reflect mitigation necessary to address cross boundary issues? Um, I'm not a transport planner, but I was actually going to, to finish by saying that I would hand over to my colleague Jody, who would actually be covering the, the cross boundary um, impacts under MIQ 10. Um, she's okay. our transport, one of our transport does she planners. Does she want to address it under them or does she want to tell me now? Whichever is your preference. I think, I, I think now as we're having the conversation. Let's go with the Hello. flow. So, thank you, sir. Um, so in answer to the question to um, our satisfaction with the conversations that have happened so far, um, yes, um, under uh, duties cooperate, we we are satisfied with, with how that's gone. You'll see in the appendix yeah. to the um, statement on duties cooperate from Bedford that there is extensive notes on what has currently and uh, been discussed in the past about we're not, talking, we're not talking about the duty here we're talking about mm -hmm. soundness we're talking about the soundness issues linked to the plan rather than the cooperation so, so yeah so um coming on to that the 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 information that's been provided has been useful but it isn't integrated into the evidence for the plan it has been done as a separate exercise on our request so i suppose the first point is that in general where the impacts have been identified and they have and they are all detailed in the appendix to our statement and will probably be more appropriate to go into detail in the hearings for those particular sites um okay. the um the the, de the details are there as an appendix as an additional piece of work but they are not integrated into the mitigation strategy or the mitigation package um, that's referenced in the report E12, which is the, the final modelling of the preferred strategy. So at the very least, the first stage would be to recognise those cross-boundary impacts in a more formal setting. Okay, and you uh, you feel that in terms of uh, in terms of looking at that, that falls better into the, the later sessions, does it, when we consider the specific, uh, specific allocations? Um, yes, I think um, the the particular issues are more related to growth at particular locations. Um, yep. The point on recognising the the arc and the context of England's economic transport strategy um, and the principles of that within which is referenced in Bedford's plan, I think is a general point. Um, but essentially, the the mitigation package is related to site specific issues. I think. Okay. We'll, uh, we'll we'll address that then. then. Thank, thank you. And you, you are coming along to that session, aren't you? A, co a colleague will be there. Yep. Yeah, for Great. for the okay. Time. We'll uh, we'll uh, speak then. Okay. Um, uh, Miss Smith, please. Thank you, sir. Um, it's just 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 a couple of points, really, that I'd, I'd make to, like to make. Um, you've obviously got our evidence um, from Reg nineteen submissions. And I'm clearly obviously not going to repeat that. I would um, 
like to make the point that I would concur with the comments from Mr Goodall just recently in, in relation to the iterative testing um, and, and particularly in relation to Kempston Hardwick when, uh, in, when it became a new settlement very late in the day. Don't consider that that is appropriate. Um, excuse me. On the issue of um, the other new settlements, the, the assessments relating to Little Barford and Y Boston, which um, are, uh, the, the, the site I'm obviously um, really concerned with, um, are very finely balanced. And the uh, new settlement assessment document um, identifies that Little Barford is chosen principally because of the proximity to the potential EWR. Um, and, and in fact, the rejection of Y Boston is based on the fact that it doesn't have a main junction to um, a strategic road network, which I, I didn't really appreciate was, a, was a, a major criteria of a new settlement in that context, but also that the, um, the Little Barford is, is, is in much closer proximity to the potential east-west rail. Now, um, a, a key point here is that Clearly, the whole strategy is predicated on the east-west rail coming to fruition, and I appreciate we're going to talk about that in in much greater deal, detail in, in in the next um in in the next question. But the point the point here is for me that it raises question questions about the sustainability of of the site in that context. Should the east-west rail fail completely um, or, or or to be delivered delivered late, and then in that context. Um, it comes back to the to the point about very being very finely balanced um, option relative to to, to Y Boston, the distance to rail stations from in in in, in relation to both sites then becomes much narrower. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Th thank you for that. I just ask the council to uh, to sum up on MIQ six and what they. Thank you, sir. Um, on that uh, last point, I would just, while well, it's fresh in my mind, I would also point out that um, the development strategy at paragraph 4.21 also says that um, why Boston isn't selected because it um, involves the loss of grade one agricultural land, um, which is not the case in Little Barford. And, and also, I, I wouldn't say that given the location of the Post rail station at Tempsford that makes uh, Y Boston of um, equivalent um, accessibility as Little Barford, as there is a small matter of the A421 and the A1 in between to cross. Um, and just summing up on the, the strategy, I, I would reiterate that we have chosen what we believe is the, the best strategy and uh, which makes the, the most of the opportunities produced uh, or made available by the, um, the East West Rail and um, improvements to the um, road infrastructure. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay, we'll move on to, uh, to uh, item number, number three. I'll look at the council now to make sure I'm actually going through Sort of, uh, yeah, sure. So yes, yes, that's absolutely fine, sir. And um, I know Mr. Chorton will have taken a note of your initial introduction, so I think he's already Bless primed. <laughs> so if he could, uh, if, he, if, if Mr. Shortland can remember what I what I said in introduction to item three, I won't uh, I won't go, go go through that again. So just but just to remind that you know we, we will be talking about infrastructure dependencies in relation to specific allocations, which um, representatives from central beds. Of course, uh, have alluded to around their their interest in matter in matter six. So we are looking at the sort of high level assumptions here around the three big bits of kit that the council say influence their choice of strategy. So if we if we start with east west rail, please, uh, Mr. Mr. Shortland, what's your sort of events have changed? Yeah. Yes. So as you say, east west rail have recently announced their preferred route. Um, They've told us that they will be consulting upon that statutory consultation in the first half of 2024. So that will be the the next chance for people to get involved in discuss in discussing that. But the route that they've announced now is the preferred one that they've cleared with the Department for Transport. So I think it's right and proper that we uh, make that um, a firm point in, in our planning. Um, in terms of what they announced, um, it 
was in the most part um, what we had been expecting. So they're talking about the route um, from Bletchley to Bedford following the route of the existing Marston Vale line. Um, they're looking at new station arrangements within that in the Stuart B and Kempston Hardwick area. They're coming through the centre of Bedford. Um, they're moving the St John's station nearer to the hospital, which is what we'd expected and what we were <clears throat> working on the basis of. Um, they're coming through Bedford Midland station, which will form the interchange between the East West main line and the Midland main line. And then they're going north out of Bedford um, across country to a new station. Um, this is somewhere where we we weren't expecting them to be announced quite what they've announced because they followed the most northerly route um, as we had expected. But instead of uh, then coming across the East Coast main line within the Little Barford allocation, they're coming slightly further south at a Tempsford location. Um, from our point of view, both of those potential locations worked with the Little Barford um, allocation that we've put into the plan so that's whilst it was a, a bit of a surprise and the fact that it goes through emp8 um, wasn't expected uh, the location of the station was one that we had been considering as one of the two options they'd consulted on previously um, in terms of construction uh, they've said that they expect to start work in 2027 um, they haven't given an, an end date for when they expect to complete that work at the moment, but I think that ties in fairly reasonably with our 2030 um, opening date that they had referred to previously in their 2021 consultation. So on East West Rail, I think things have moved forward a lot in the last month. And in terms of the local plan, they've moved forward in a way that's um, entirely consistent with it. Okay, so so what 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 I'm hearing there, and, and obviously the East West Rail announcement is as you as you mentioned, subjected to to consultation. Um, in terms of the the Tempsford location for the for the new station, that was um, was 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 that factored in when you were looking at your choice of spatial strategy that that would would be one of the potential locations? Or yes, yes, it was the the East West Rail Company proposed two potential locations in their 2021 consultation, and they've selected one of those two, and we've been working on the basis that it would be one of those two. Okay, and in terms of the, uh, you obviously said it said about the implications for MP, and we'll come on to to discuss that in the the particular matter session. In terms of the of the timings and your working assumption for the for the plan, you said around starting work in 20, 2027 was the the assumption with the announcement and the assumption yep. that you're working on. In terms of in terms of your choice of strategy and uh, your assumptions around East West Rail, did you did you factor in any contingency for it coming forward later than, than planned? So any sort of you know allowance for it not coming forward exactly when um when anticipated uh, we didn't factor that in as part of the plan but in you'll have seen in our statement in um, in advance of these hearings that we are accepting of the fact that some development may be able to come forward ahead of the railway being in operation so in terms of allowing for sort of delays and things like that would your sort of reaction would be or what, what you've thought about it is actually that the amount of development that could come forward um, without, you know, without that particular piece of infrastructure being being operational. So that's where you get your your contingency. Is yes, that, is that? I think that's a fair okay. summation. Yes. Okay, we can we can talk about that again in relation to the the specific uh, the specific matters and just just for everybody's um, uh, everybody's knowledge. So we have a uh, we have a letter from east west rail that was the from the the 8th of june so just before this uh, this session that's at ed 27 in the examination library i won't i won't repeat I, we, we will that that talks about the the spatial strategy element it doesn't say a lot about the spatial strategy element to be honest it just says see our previous comments and it says more in relation to little barford and um and q14 doesn't it so we'll, we'll come on to talk about those in due course but people can read ed27 in their in, the, in, in their own time if they'd, they they'd uh, they'd they if they'd like to um so mo moving on to the next one what i'll do is i'll hear i'll hear the sort of latest on the three and then and then ask sort of if people have any sort of comments or whatever. So so the latest on the uh, Black Cat to Caxton Gibbet link road. 
Yes. Um, this was given um, approval by the Secretary of State to their DCO in August last year. Um, a group called Transport Action Network then tried to launch a judicial review of that, so things have been on hold. Um, however, on the 18th of May, the Court of Appeal refused Transport Action Network's applications um, to appeal the refusal of a judicial review. And so everything is now in place. The DCO can be implemented. We spoke to National Highways in a meeting last week, and they say they plan to move into full construction at the end of 2023, and the road will be open in 2027. So that's that's uh, that's different to what you say in the assumption in 7.7 .7 of your paper around it being between 2024 and 2026. So that's. I, I um, I'm quoting their latest words to me. I, personally, I feel they may have allowed themselves a little room to impress by delivering early, but they're saying in 2027. I mean, early early delivery of anything, I think, would be uh, would be would be good. One. But uh, um, but in term in terms of your sort of working assumptions, as you'd previously set out, it had been between 2024 and 2026. We're now hearing 2027 as the latest. Does that have any? And if we take that as as it is. Uh, 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 word um, does that have any implications in terms of the the spatial strategy? No, it doesn't. Um, the spatial strategy um, is um, based on the road being open, and the step trajectory is based on it being open by twenty thirty. Um, so, being open by twenty twenty seven is a good yes. thing in the, in terms of that. So, the way you're looking at it is, you've got three years grace, essentially. Yes. Um, before actually the reliance on uh, Caxton and uh, the, the Black Hat to Caxton Gibber actually kicks it. That's correct, yes. Yeah. Okay. And the uh, the new Wixom station? Yep. Um, the council is acting as sponsor for the new station um, following the breakdown of the original arrangements where uh, rail track were going to fund half of the costs. Um, there were changes to government rules about railway expenditure in the early 2010s, which ruled that out. So as a, from 2018, the council has been promoting the scheme and has accepted the role of sponsor. We wrote the strategic outline business case and submitted that to government in March last year. Um, they wrote to us on May the 5th to say that they had accepted that and were happy for it to move forward subject to some conditions that they've laid out. Uh, one of those is that we run our costings through network rail to make sure that they are happy with them, um, with the indication that they may be able to reduce them somewhat. So we're quite pleased about that. Um, the plan is that we go into construction in 2024 and the scheme is open as soon as possible thereafter. Okay. Thank you. Th th thank you for that. And the. Um... But th those are just on the, the the three the three sort of big big bits of kit. I've got others on there. But what I what I'd like to do is that those are your sort of you know your your big sort of identified ones, and, and people can talk about others if they want to when they make their contributions. But just as those were essentially factual updates, what I'd like to do is roll MIQ seven straight into MIQ nine. So that's essentially coming on to talk about you know given the factual update you've you've given and the considerations and all the rest of it and the timings whether or not there's sufficient flexibility within the spatial strategy to accommodate that i think i think those two things naturally flow into each other and i think so people can make useful contributions i think um i think it's helpful to probably take those two in, in tandem at the same time if that's okay um, so can i just ask the council just to sort of give their position in relation to miq9 please yes my colleague carolyn barnes will speak to that thank you Thank you. As we said in our, our statement, in terms of the overall strategy, um, there, there is, in our view, uh, very little uh, room for flexibility. Um, the reason why we say that is because of the fact that there is this strong relationship between infrastructure delivery in, in the latter years and, and the plan uh, itself. Um, we would um, explain our uh, statement that um, we see that that flexibility as being very narrow on the basis of the national context uh, in which in which we sit. Uh, this plan is being prepared at a time 
when the challenges that we face in, in terms of climate change uh, have never been greater and uh, the need to focus on actions which reduce carbon um, have, have never been more important. And that provides us with the uh, very fundamental starting point and driver for, for the strategy. East West Rail obviously is a national project uh, which along with the other strategic infrastructure improvements that we're talking about through in terms of both uh, road and rail, um, it's right that um, these rightly drive the strategy in, in the context of uh, the uh, climate change issues which which I've I've mentioned um, in, in terms of ensuring that we start to move towards um, lower emission uh, solutions, et cetera. Um, we, we think it's, it's difficult to see how um, a plan could uh, provide what we might say as, as meaningful uh, flexibility with, without um, um, actually getting to the point where what effect, the effect is, is, is to create a, a different um, strategy. So the question uh, specifically asked under the matter is about um, if there are un unexpected, unexpected delays and um, what, uh, how we'd respond uh, to that. Um, if, uh, if there is uh, some, some delay, then uh, there is a measure of, of flexibility that, that could be achieved uh, by um, amending the step trajectory to um, in, in a way which uh, in the situation where, where the delay led to um, slower slow delivery rates, then, then there is an, a degree to which um, there, could, there could be flexibility around that in terms of the trajectory. However, um, at the point at which um, there, well, there was very significant uh, delay um, of the of the East West Rail project, or, or if indeed it was was, was cancelled. Uh, then, in that instance, um, the the response uh, should appropriately be to um, to go to a review uh, of the, of the strategy as a whole. Um, so, at that point we would be in a situation where we'd be looking to to review and we'd need to um, to look at um, how other uh, neighboring authorities could work with us to assist in in meeting those development needs or, or indeed um, to look to the joint actions uh, of the um, the pan regional part partnership so um, that that would that would be uh, our approach. Um, I'm aware that it's been suggested that uh, flexibility could be achieved by uh, locating development um, in the villages, and we've already heard representations today that 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 would be uh, a way to um, to to address uh, this issue. Um, but um, we we would uh, say in terms of that. Uh, that uh, the um, the quantum of development that would would need to go in into the villages to make up the kind of shortfalls which had been advanced by some some representors um, would in effect re represent uh, an entirely um, different strategy which for the reasons we've been explaining this this morning um, would would not be acceptable. Okay, so we've we've uh, just just going through each of those sort of flexibility aspects as as they've been sort of mentioned. So so uh, the, the first one I appreciate it wasn't it wasn't um, uh, by you uh, as Barnes. It was actually by Mr. Shortland, which was around uh, looking at where development could be brought forward without the contingent infrastructure sort of being being necessarily in place. So looking at how much could come could come forward. So we, we got we've obviously got that option or we've, we've talked about that briefly. Then the next thing is around amending the stepped trajectory. So what, what would be the sort of formal mechanism for for that? The um, within the context of the um, 
trajectory that that we have the the the, the steps as you as you aware have three steps and the final step um is from 2030 to 2040 and it wouldn't it wouldn't require any uh, formal change because that um period from 2030 to 2040 it it, rep it represents um it represents an ab an average across that period so it wouldn't require any formal change so it wouldn't require any change to the adopted plan to actually do that it would be a sort of informal thing essentially that the council would take discretion to do and the discretion it would be within the discretion that 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 falls within the yeah. plan yes and the choice of whether to do it or not would would rest with the with the council um so that uh so but that that's in the instance where you know there are there are delays and things get pushed pushed back as you as you mentioned given given what you say about the planned provision of of these items being you know key to you deciding on the spatial strategy that you, you chose if you know if something is profoundly different then that would essentially create a new a need to review review the plan is that, that that's your position on that is it it is yeah and again that you know as the plan is currently drafted the discretion on whether to do that or not again would rest with the with the council yes and indeed uh, as you know plans uh, will need to be regularly uh, reviewed and that there are obviously um, strategic points at, at which we are obliged as a council to consider if, if a review. So while uh, there, uh, so are there, and you can probably anticipate this question: Are there useful uh, to give certainty? Uh, are there useful trigger points or things that could be put in the plan to state the when a, when a review would be would be triggered? earlier than the five years or at the discretion of the council otherwise are there sort of useful trigger trigger points that you could identify that would give certainty and say if this happens then game's over we're reviewing the plan i think that um, we would um, like every council we would have a commitment to regularly review the plan and in determining whether a view is is required we would have regard to our information at that time about the uh, progress towards achieving the plan and we would take all of those factors into account at, at that point and make a decision about the timing and the the scope of the view of the review that would be required at that time okay, okay. and i need obviously i need to hear the evidence in relation to supply because also people have talked about the delivery rates of different sites and things like that and obviously this is an issue as well so my mind is isn't made up or anything on this but if 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 i were to conclude that there were sort of specific delivery issues here that you know required something to be specifically written into the plan about the circumstances when it would be reviewed would it be within the council's um would the council does the council at this stage think that they could usefully think awesome of some trigger spend. points um I'm I don't think Ms. Barnes heard what you were saying there, Inspector, but I, I did. Um, oh, good. <laughs> I'm afraid I only got to the point where you said if if I were, and I'm sorry I didn't hear anything okay. after that because but um, it, it, Mr. Shortland heard me, so hopefully he can respond without making me say it again because I don't think yeah, like I I think we'd be happy to um, go away and think about whether there were any of such points, but I'm not immediately able to commit to any. No, no, not not at all. And as I say, we got we got we got a lot to to get through before then. It's more it's more just the opportune time to sort of obviously we'll be talking about plan review at a later stage anyway. So uh, as we talked about when a review would be triggered, it's obviously appropriate for me to flag at this time whether or not there'd be there'd be specific triggers around that and whether that would give certainty while at the same time. Um, you know, uh, create some flexibility, but, uh, but again, I'm just. just raising it at this stage um, my mind's not not made up on anything um okay uh sorry Ms. barnes had you had you concluded what you wanted to say yes thank you yeah okay uh let's ask for uh, other contributions on miq7 and miq9 as well so i've, I've kind of segued into into both of them and we have we have hands. Uh, Mr. Mr. Behrens, I know for a fact that you were first hand up as you were a, an early adopter, so please uh, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, always good to get your, your hand up early. Uh, uh, when Sometimes. You, um, <laughs> but in terms of 
sorry, I'll, I'll try and put my hand down as well. Um, in terms of uh, what we've just here, and I think it's important to reflect in terms of um, any review, any trigger points and, and flexibility, is the degree of homes that are coming forward, the degree of development that's coming forward in the last 10 years of the plan, sir. I think based on G9, uh, the, the council's step trajectory is that uh, some 17,889 homes are due to be delivered in the in the final 10 years of the plan. It's about 65% of, uh, of the housing that's due to be supplied uh, uh, across the whole plan period. Um, I think we've got 7,600 homes coming out from the final 10 years from two allocations, both of which are uh, uh, linked to the strategic infrastructure that's just been discussed. Um, we've also got to remember that 3,000 homes that are due to be delivered in uh, that were expected to be delivered if if they were uh, the plan was meeting um, the standard method uh, in the first 10 years about 3000 home shortfall and those are expected to be delivered in the final 10 years of the plan so what we have is a considerable amount of developments expected to come forward in that final 10 years uh, on the basis of the the infrastructure so and there is risks around that that infrastructure and whether it will come forward and i think the difficulty with the, the, the council's approach is that if you're looking at a review or or looking at uh, in terms of that, you're looking at a, part, a point quite a way into the plan period itself and whether a review would actually be effective in ensuring that homes that won't come forward in the last 10 years or even some of those homes that were expected or should have been delivered in the first 10 years will actually ever come forward within this plan period. So you, you've got a sense of actually is it on the basis of the the risks and the, to this strategy a deliverable strategy over the plan period or whether there actually is need for that flexibility in terms of supply to offset some of those risks to ensure that the that the plan is deliverable and obviously the greater the risks the more additional supply and we would say you know in terms of the early part of the plan in terms of ensuring more coming forward then on on sites that yeah, uh, that could be delivered without the the key infrastructure that that's required, and it it seems that there is. And we we talked uh, on Tuesday about what, what the trigger point is of when the infrastructure is needed and and that development. And and Mr. Shorten suggested that there was inf development that could come before before that infrastructure, more that is planned in twenty thirty, but could come before the infrastructure is actually delivered. So there might be a point at which that bites, and in, in terms of providing some of that uh, uh, that flexibility. So I think it's. I think those those are our concerns. So it's just the the, the scale of uh, of what hasn't what won't the shortfall against needs in that first part against the delivery. I, we mentioned earlier, and other participants mentioned in terms of whether delivery rates are, are realistic, and obviously we'll, we'll we'll come to those. But that is also that additional risk there, sir, is that not only that the infrastructure doesn't come forward uh, as expected in terms of the time, but then actually also those sites don't deliver at the rates that are expected, pushing even more um, uh, uh, delivery back even beyond the plan period. So, and, and those were points that were raised on Tuesday and also points that were, uh, uh, that have been raised, uh, raised today. And I think it's those risks that need to be offset with the greatest degree of flexibility to ultimately ensure that the plan is deliverable uh, across the plan period it isn't just pushing everything further down the line as it already is with the step trajectory it's still pushing that development uh, further down the line to the point at which you could just end up with a not meeting that need over the plan period and, and a review required that will just mean that actually needs that should have been delivered during the plan period are just delivered beyond 2040 and, uh, and considerably beyond 2040 sir so I think that's that's ultimately where our, our point. I think early trigger points, if you, if they are to be put, they need to be early within the within the plan. So there is there is a, a clear uh, impetus really to to get those those sites forward and delivered, rather than waiting till uh, twenty thirty and, and beyond to do that. Where it'll take a long time to prepare a new plan and uh, and deliver that and uh, and ultimately not not meet the needs that that are, that are required to be delivered during this plan period. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Munro, please. Let me, sorry, you can hear me. I'm just trying to figure out how you can actually see me as well. <laughs> if, if you really need to see me. Uh, two seconds. Uh, oh, there we go, start video. Right, okay, thank you. I mean, if you can't win the Toblerone race, I think having a name that begins with A always helps. Um, or M. Uh, oh, oh, well. <laughs> In terms of answer to your question, I mean, obviously, our view is that there clearly is not sufficient flexibility. And, I, and actually, listening to Miss Barnes um, in her openings, I think she accepts as much. 
Um, as explained in our statement towards matter three, I mean, the plan's only able to identify supply, which at best um, allows for a buffer of 4.6% on its entire planned housing requirement. And that's a housing requirement which, as covered at length on Tuesday, does not include any sort of uplift or buffer. So, as far as plans go, it's um, as lacking in flexibility as possible. I mean, obviously, part of our submission at Regulation 19 um, re emphasised the properties of our, our client's land. I mean, there's, there's, there's other sites, obviously, with similar properties on the urban edge that are sustainable, eminently deliverable, um, and uh, would not be at prejudice with the actual urban first spatial strategy. So, there obviously are options there to build in that flexibility. Um, for the answer for your for the answer of your question to be yes, um, you know, there is sufficient flexibility. Every single site in the trajectory has to deliver on time and at the rate envisaged by the trajectory to meet the council's local housing need. So if sir, you are to be comfortable with the plan will meet will be one that meets the needs of the borough, you have to be comfortable that every assumption in the plan is justified and every moving part is well oiled. And that includes the eventual delivery of 600 dwellings per year at each of the council's new settlements in parallel and obviously towards the end of the plan period. So a lot of the assumptions that Mr. Barron mentioned. In any event, the question is predicated in the term unexpected delays whilst maintaining the credibility of the overall strategy. The delays in delivery of the bulk of the borough's dwellings are entirely expected resulting in a deficit of 3,450 homes, so 450 more than Mr. Berndt alluded to in the first years discussed on Tuesday. In fact, and the council is actually asking you to bake in significant delays as part of its trajectory. To quote Mr. Goodall on Tuesday, the plan is actually set up not to fail, partially by asking you to accept that these delays in deferring significant growth to the 2030 period are justified. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Easton, please. Thank you. So I'm, I'm very mindful of the fact that you um, did indicate that you'd rather have one spokesperson per topic, but Mr. Favog and I have divided them up. So if you don't mind, I'll deal briefly with the flexibility point. I have to admit at this stage, I never said that I've got absolutely no way of policing it. So you, uh, so you're, uh, you'd be, you know, I'll, I'll leave it to you to be a, an honest broker on it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's fine. Thank you very much, sir. And then uh, Mr. Favarg will explain how reliance on infrastructure, particularly EWR, could potentially derail the plan. Um, so, as far as flexibility is concerned, so we say, first of all, flexibility is a key component of effectiveness, which is a, an aspect of the soundness test. And the, the council's admission in its hearing statement that there is limited if any flexibility and that there is no plan b uh, is a is a frank concession but a rather surprising one given that it is reliant on a on significant pieces of infrastructure not simply one but a whole range of different pieces of infrastructure uh, which those working in the planning system should be aware of the fact that there are inevitably going to be delays and there may even be situations where those pieces of infrastructure do not come forward. So there is absolutely, in answer to your question, sir, is there sufficient flexibility within the spatial strategy to accommodate unexpected delays? No, there isn't, there's none. And there should be, uh, that makes the plan ineffective. Next point, sir, is that the council has indicated to you and, and in the hearing statements that there are options to respond to a situation where there are delays the um, amending a trajectory or a, an early review. So that it's, it's really important to note that the local authority should have submitted a sound plan originally, and the plan should be sound on adoption. It's not acceptable, in our view, uh, to treat the prospect of review if things go wrong as a get out of jail free card for this plan. And I just do note that the plan that you're examining at the moment, sir, is already a review. So if when the inevitable delays take place, the council has to conduct a review, they're asking you to conduct a review of, of a review or we'll bake that into the plan. Um, so that's not good plan making. It needs to be sensible and predictable from the outset. So far as amending the trajectory is concerned, I, I know what the council said about 
there being no necessity to change the policies in the plan, um, but they would rely, rely on their discretion. Again, that, that is not a recipe for sound and predictable decision making, because um, clients such as mine and other developers will have to anticipate if the if the directory is going to be amended, what that is likely to be amended to, and won't, uh, as we sit here today, have any clear idea about how to make investment decisions, when to make a planning application, because it'll be ultimately dependent entirely on the council's discretion. So th there is no flexibility in the plan, sir. Th there should be, and there's an obvious answer to it. You've heard us say this on numerous occasions. It is possible to have a hybrid approach to the spatial strategy, which includes contingency sites to anticipate what is inevitably going to be delay in the strategic sites. So, so I'll hand over to Mr. Favard now. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank, thanks, Jonathan. Um, sir, can I take you to document E13, please, which is infrastructure delivery plan need for a stepped trajectory. E13. Yeah. Uh, page 18 or PDF page 18, which is a table 5.2, which basically sets out the infrastructure dependencies for the strategic sites. Let's confirm the council have that as well. Sorry, Mr. Bird, does someone at the council have that? But yeah, keeping up. Sorry, page 18, wasn't it? Yeah, page 18, table 5.2, and that sets out the dependencies between the mm -hmm. strategic sites and the various significant infrastructure schemes that are required. Um, in the in the table, the, 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 there's the list of strategic sites in the left-hand column, and then obviously all of the, the, the significant infrastructure that's required. Um, those those um, sites and infrastructure marked with a two um, are where it sets out in the report that it would be highly unlikely that a site could come forward without the scheme being in place. So it's just demonstrating the significance of, of, of the infrastructure that's required to support strategic site delivery. Um, obviously, we know that we know from this table and, 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 and previously how significant East West Rail is to to, to delivery of the strategy, you'll see from table 5.2 that it is fundamental to the delivery of both of the new settlement um, options at, at, at Kempston, Hardwick and Little Barford. Now, I know we've had an update on East West Rail um, and we heard a moment ago that there's going to be a consultation in, um, in 2024. Um, yes, there's been an update. But there's still a really, really long way to go. I mean, we've got the consultation. There'll then need to be um, a, a development consent order. We still don't know how the scheme is is going to be funded or if it's going to be funded. So there's still there's still a long way to go. And not least, as as as, as some of us will be aware, significant local opposition, not least from the leader of of, of Bedford Council. Um, so so that so that's East West Rail, but. But what Table 5.2 also shows is, you know, beyond the sort of rail-based strategy, there's still a significant number of highway um, schemes which are which are also required. And I know we we were talking about A428, um, but widening of the A421 is still a considerable um, infrastructure uh, piece of infrastructure that's required. And you'll see from Table 5.2 that that relates to the delivery of. Uh, 3,800 at, at, at Campston Hardwick and 1,800 dwellings east east of Wixom's. But the A421 widening is still subject to um, the outcome of Road Investment Strategy 3. So, so my understanding is that that is still, it's a big infrastructure scheme, scheme that still remains uncertain and subject to government decision. So, I mean, you'll have seen um, the comments from, from from National Highways as well, who still have considerable um, issues with the plan and, it, and, its, and its deliverability in terms of how it links with all of these 
highway highway works and and a few moments ago we were, we were hearing from central bedfordshire who were raising the, the point regarding cross boundary and the need for further work so i think it was just just a just a point sir that you can see the number of infrastructure schemes that are that are required but there's still considerable uncertainty around all of this and it's not just east west rail it's a421 widening and there's the other schemes that are listed that are listed in there and and also we don't know we don't know the trigger points so so what's what when is the infrastructure required to support delivery of of, of the strategic sites so yeah it, it just leaves considerable uncertainty and risk to the delivery of the plan as a whole thank you sir okay. Thank you. Th th thank you for that. Uh, it's Mr. Mr. Robinson next. If we can keep contributions as direct as possible and not repeat. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Um, I'll be brief. Um, just regarding the point about flexibility, um, as we discussed in yesterday's Matter 4 hearing session, you know, we consider the level of quantitative need for employment land is, is considerably in excess of the supply that's currently allocated. And, you know, we've already heard from the council that um, the scope for flexibility is very narrow. Um, I mean, just to take one example, um, there's considerable uncertainty regarding delivery of 17 hectares on site M8. Um, due to the fact that the preferred alignment of East West Rail has now been diverted to align with the new station at Tempsford, and we've, we've just heard about that on the East West Rail commentary. Now, that runs straight through the middle of, of the site. Others have raised the point as to whether that, that's going to happen or not. But either way, there's considerable uncertainty as to its developability or deliverability. So in such circumstances of delay over delivery, or even if it's entirely uh, removed from the portfolio of sites, then just from an employment perspective, the spatial strategy is going to have to reflect the opportunities for the council's ambition for a diverse economy and to positively plan for such eventualities. So all that reinforces our concerns, and as we've already stated in matter four, of the need for flexibility to be hardwired into the plan, which can address the uncertainty and deliver sustainable growth. So the last point to make is that in view of that narrow flexibility that the council officer has just referred to, um, we feel that this could potentially be achieved with the insertion of new supporting text to policy DS4S. Um, as we've previously suggested, um, referring to saved policy 72S of the local plan 2030, as my colleague Mr. Cairns KC suggested yesterday. Thank you. Good afternoon, Inspector. My name is Rachel Crick. I'm from Averson Young and I'm here today representing Cloudwing, who are the promoter for land at Kempston Hardwick. So in respect of the spatial strategy and MIQ9, I wanted to bring your attention to the point that land at Kempston Hardwick in particular has sufficient flexibility to be delivered in the event that there are unexpected delays to the delivery of the east-west rail. I know that this is going to be discussed in further matters when we consider the deliverability of the site, but I do think it is pertinent point to raise now around the discussions on flexibility of the spatial strategy. Um, so I just wanted to bring your attention to the fact that significant technical work has been carried out to support the Bedford Business Park planning application, which covers Cloudwing's land, and that this application is not reliant on the delivery of East West Rail. Indeed, any strategic highways matters with Highways England have also now been resolved and their initial holding objection has been removed. So we've reached a position um, in our statement of common ground with the council, which I believe you should have now received. I think that's document ED31. Um, and on page five, that confirms that there is an agreement that there, there are no significant technical constraints that would prevent the delivery of the new settlement within Kempston Hardwick. And I think um, the, one of the previous speakers referred to ED 14, table 5.2, and I think that's somewhat outdated in respect of the assessment of infrastructure interdependencies on East West Rail at Kempston Hardwick. We, we do have an agreed position with the council in our statement of common ground on page four, section 4.G under the matters agreed that a, de a degree of delivery of development on Kempston Hardwick, including Cloudwing land, can commence independently of the delivery of the new East West Rail Station. 
um, subject to the necessary highways improvements being in place. So as in, in respect of the spatial strategy, I just wanted to provide a bit of reassurance to you that in um, there is sufficient flexibility in the plan for employment floor space at Kempston Hardwick to be delivered without the rail. And that in our view, the road infrastructure that would be associated with this scheme could also facilitate the delivery of new housing as well. Um, and we appreciate that the actual phasing of infrastructure delivery would be considered further through the South of Bedford SPD um, and master plan work. Thank you, sir. Um, I'll just zoom in to exclude my colleague. <laughs> in fact, I'll just crack on rather wasting time. Um, yes, sir, in terms of the, the question, unexpected delays, even without the unexpected delays, there's still going to be only a 5% flexibility, as the previous speaker mentioned. Um, I'll direct you to, obviously, paragraph 7.3 of the sustainability appraisal, which talks, which states, in the absence of a methodology for calculating a higher alternative figure, a 10% uplift to the housing, local housing need is proposed. So even, even the 5% in the plan is contrary to what's set out in the SA. Um, Ms. Barnes obviously referred earlier to, well, the consequences of providing more flexibility is um, fundamentally changing the spatial strategy and also issues of climate change. Even if you were to hit the 10% flexibility, that's only an additional 1,300 dwellings, and that can be easily accommodated on sites on the existing urban edge of Bedford and on sites um, at key service centres. So I don't think it would fundamentally change the spatial strategy and it wouldn't conflict with climate change because you're just extending existing existing settlements. Um, I think it was the, the, the HBF mentioned about sort of kicking the can down the road through a number of re reviews and the consequences in the short and medium term. As we've said in our Regulation 19 uh, representations, there's a worsening of a trend of worsening on, on affordability and increase in house prices in Bedford since 2013. So it's already the issue in terms of unaffordability growing over the past 10 years. And um, that's why I think having that additional flexibility and providing these um, other allocations would help that issue as well. Um, and I won't repeat anything else, so I'm happy to leave it there, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I, um, just as a point of uh, clarity in terms of the matter that I'll be speaking to, I'm focused really at the moment on MIQ7. I know that there's obviously been a bit of uh, fluidity between MIQ7 and 9 in this session, but it's principally related really to uh, matters affecting the major infrastructure, East-West Rail, uh, and, and matters associated with the Black Cat, Caxton, Gibbet, Link Road. So, and I think really it's... Uh, and it really, you know, you've no doubt heard certain points on this already, so I won't go um, over over the same things twice, so to speak. But um, what we are already seeing with regard to East West Rail and its expected delivery is is a continual pattern of delay to the project. So it's been beset with quite a number of significant issues and challenges in terms of uh, defining routes, considering routes, and so on and so forth. And obviously, as we've heard from the council today. There is a further statutory consultation process that won't uh, won't take place until the first part of next year. Um, and following on from that, there is likely to be a significant and fairly extensive body of additional work. Um, in the in the latest reports that the that East West Rail have have published, and obviously in the in in stating their preference for what they refer to as the Route One alternative. Um, so they basically say that obviously uh, they, they talk about the uh, uh, alignment nine was assessed as likely to have a greater levels of impact on the environment and was more expensive than line one. I think there's a general acknowledgement that clearly from a cost perspective, actually, the, and the infrastructure requirements, uh, the route through to station from alignment one is is complicated by virtue of the fact that it needs to cross the existing A421. Uh, it crosses uh, minor roads uh, serving uh, Roxton area and, and Great Barford. It then crosses the A1 to the south of uh, the Black Cap Junction. So it crosses more local roads before forming its intersection with Thameswood Railway Station, before then having even to 
follow an alignment that takes it underneath the proposed route of the A428 um, in itself. So, I th I, you know, th there is likely to be a significant review in terms of the likely costings associated with the project, all of which I suspect is going to lead towards some form of, uh, of delay. Um, and even in their report, so on page 100 of the route preferences report that uh, that came out, sorry, this could be one second to definitively get my base right, which I think was published in May of this year. Uh, on the foot of page 103, they say alignment one, the Tempsford variant may be subject to adjustment and refinement as a result of ongoing assessment and design development work. We'll provide further details at the statutory consultation uh, and so on and so forth. So all of which, all of which I think probably um, presents a shared view by many that there's likely to be significant delay to uh, the delivery of this. What I think that that then means clearly, obviously, is that uh, that you know the program in terms of a DCO, its application and so forth, and that determination coming out from the other side of a legal challenge period, which we've just experienced with the Black Cat uh, scheme, caused quite a significant degree of. Uh, uncertainty, I think, on the ability to effectively um, taking Mr. Shortland's comments, start on site in 2027 uh, and then have a railway line that's open in three years after that. Um, my understanding is that the rail route is from Bedford through to Cambridge is there is in the vicinity of about 30 miles worth of rail routes, sir. And so um, that's three times longer than the A428 Caxton Gibbet scheme is. In length, and it's uh, that's taken four years to build. So, I, I, m based upon our papers, and I think you've seen in our matter statements that have been submitted on behalf of Taylor Wimpy, that I think realistically, at the best, I think our expectation most likely really is that the railway line would probably be uh, open and available, probably closer to 2036, maybe even further down the line than that. Um, where that leaves. Uh, certain of the strategy and the strategic allocations, I think, sir, is that a lot of the land that's allocated in the east of the borough will be subject to possessions by the East West Rail Company during the course of that construction period. And so I think that that's likely to uh, cause further concern about the delivery of dwellings and whether or not actually the, the strategy for allocation is, uh, is sound. We'll probably know that go on to further matters, sir, that I was wishing to explore when we deal with the particular topics on matter six next week. Um, so I won't um, won't labor on on a particular point further, but just um, just one one brief further point regarding the A428 scheme. Um, I note in the in the infrastructure delivery plan um, that that supports the local plan, there is a reference to a scheme for circa 50 million pounds for a new highway junction onto the a428 associated with the uh, Little Barford allocation. Um, my reading of the matter is it's not entirely agreed between the parties that that junction is absolutely necessary, but clearly it sits there and there's a particular piece of infrastructure that's felt necessary as part of the uh, IDP, albeit that I don't believe that actually forming a junction onto the A428 has been considered in any evidence. Uh, base that supported the transport modelling. So whether or not that's accounting for any localised impacts that would arise as a consequence of that, um, I don't believe have been uh, fully considered. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Freer, please. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, a, a brief contribution, you'll be relieved uh, after my previous one. Um, I, we've talked how helpfully the council have about the um, opportunities that there would be or the responses that you could make uh, if you found yourself uh, needing to address uh, non-delivery and various options have been set up and put in place um, or, or discussed. The most radical one being uh, the need to review the plan because uh, it was clear that you had to adopt a different strategy. Uh, to that being proposed, and that is quite a radical option, I suppose. Um, I think probably the one, dis one, one distinction I'm thinking is in place here is that um, partly we've got a plan, uh, we've, we've not got necessarily the normal circumstance where you've got a plan uh, that is incrementally moving towards a different approach. Um, it sent, I, I sense that we, we're ending up 
with a plan here that has got more radical changes in strategy at the moment. So there are elements uh, of, if you like, supply that are being sort of turned off through the plan. If you wanted to take a tap analogy, uh, there are limited opportunities just beyond Bedford. The uh, key settlement policies, a feature of key settlement centre policies, a feature of the last local plan, not a feature of this local plan. So in a sense, that makes the review option a little bit more difficult to implement because you, in part, some of the sources of supply are being turned off. And though it's harder to be, turn it on at short no, shorter notice through a review later on in the plan period. And I suppose the only final comment I would add to that then is, is if there is confidence. Oh, Mr. Freer, you've, uh, you've gone off audio for me. Is it the same for the council? Yeah, Mr. Freer, we can't hear you anymore. Am I back? Yes. So can you hear me now? Is that okay? Mr. Bird, can you hear? So I can hear Mr. Freer. He did go for a moment, but he's back on again. Am I still speaking? Yes. Yep. I can hear you now. I do beg your pardon, especially if that's my technology. Um, my, my final point, so I had just got to the point of saying it's slightly more difficult to review and bring back a strategy into place uh, if some elements of supply had been uh, um, effectively sort of turned off as part of that. The only other thing I would say is that if, the, if it is the case that the strategy that the council are putting in place uh, is the right one, why would you not want to give it its best chance of success uh, and to avoid the risk of having to undertake a review to go down a different strategy by building in flexibility uh, and a more balanced approach that allows other options that makes it less risky of having to have uh, a review of that strategy, whether that's through, as other contributors have said, hybrid strategies, whether it's by allowing a continued contributions uh, from other sources of supply that have supplied in the past, why would you not want to give that the best opportunity to avoid the need to have a review to give your own strategy that you believe and have confidence in uh, the best chance of success rather than have to again turn off that tap at a later date and revert back to something different at that point in time? It was only that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Agnew. Thank you, sir. I'll try and keep it brief because you've heard many points there, much of what I agree with. I suppose it's not disputed that there is a lack of flexibility in strategy. And I suppose I'm always going to bang this drum that the reason for that is the lack of growth in the villages. And I suppose trying to think of why that is the case is a, an overly pessimistic view of development in the villages in terms of climate change. We're talking about a plan of an end date of 2040, and we're already looking at people's behaviors changing in terms of working patterns. And we know that there'll be less possible views in terms of vehicles going forward. So when we're looking at projecting it so far forward, it's weird, well not weird, it's strange that the the village growth is not being is not being supported in the plan to roll it forward. It's already been a successful strategy in the 2030 plan. And we're now relying on strategic infrastructure that does have this uncertainty and high risk that we're likely to re rely on a review of the review in years to come. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. We are at uh, we're at 20 past one now. I was going to bring the contributions to an end on this matter, but I see two further hands have gone up. So we're up to uh, we're up to four four now. So I think I think it is un unreasonable to uh, to not break for a uh, for lunch at this time. I'm suggesting to the council that we break now for lunch until until two and then resume with contributions afterwards is that is that okay for the council or would you prefer to hear hear everything and then take a later lunch uh, no i think probably a break now would be sensible so it's been yeah. a long session so that would I be think, helpful uh, i think i think that's that's probably is the right uh, the right call there to give everyone a fair uh, a fair go okay so it's 20 past uh, one now so we'll uh, we'll resume at two o'clock thank you Can sorry everybody... excuse me uh we, we actually all need to come out of the meeting apologies Thanks. Uh, you should all have a invitation for the, this afternoon's meeting. So if you can leave this meeting and join the 2 p.m. session. Many thanks. Thank you. Sorry for that, Louise. I didn't follow your instructions. Not a problem.